If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Hey, man. That was a great conversation with uh, Dr. Jordan Shallow, the Always. muscle doc. Always. Yes. Always. He's like a uh, he beast from X-Men. He's beast. I swear to God. Dude, he's we the just freaking, paint him blue. He's like yak as hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then super, super smart. Yeah. Very, very smart guy. Uh, mobility expert. It's a great contrast. Sure. Yeah. Especially in, in regards to performance, like when it comes to training and lifting. And Well, I love to meet movers and shakers in fields, and, and he's... He is a, a power lifter, right? I mean, he is a. So I was just trying to move and shake. Right mm-hmm. there. He through and through a power lifter, right? The dudes, the dudes pulling like close to se- he's over seven hundred pounds. Yeah, he's deadlift, over yeah. seven hundred pound deadlift. He's got a fucking six hundred pounds. The guy's a fucking animal, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what's so unique he does about a lot of pistol squats? Well, yeah, right. So his mobility is incredible for his size. Like to me, like. I, it's one thing to be a guy who's like super hyper mobile or a guy that's super strong, but those are but very to be both. To be both, it takes a lot of discipline. Yeah, a lot of discipline, and to see a guy like him move, and it, it, it's obvious, right? Because how he's very intelligent. He has a very methodical way of uh, approaching his training. Mm-hmm. He hasn't bought into the hippie stuff yet, though. Yeah, let's <laughs> be honest. <laughs> well, we did a whole YouTube series also with him at Mind Pump TV, which you'll see. We have one that's already up, and we, uh, we're we going to be doing some more with him. Um, but the information that he presents is, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, and it's not common anymore to be really blown away by someone with their information, especially when it comes to movement. Um, and uh, Dr. Jordan Shaw is one of those people that kind of blows us away. You know, he showed some stuff when it, in regards to the hips and how to isolate different parts of the hip flexors. And when the depending on the, the positioning of the joint, which muscles are being activated, which ones aren't. And mm-hmm. Really, really good stuff. So we had a great conversation with him. He also has a podcast. He has a new podcast you could check out. It's called RX Radio. So the letter R, the letter X, apostrophe D, radio. His Instagram page is awesome. Especially if you're a personal trainer, um, I highly suggest you go to his Instagram page. He goes into great detail. It's awesome. And follow it. Um, It's the underscore muscle underscore doc. His website is themusceldoc.com. And that's pretty much it. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Dr. Jordan Shallow, a.k.a. the muscle doc. The beast. Like, is there a trigger for you as far as like... How I feel? Yeah. I try and be ahead of that. So like if, if so preemptive, yeah. So I try and like I said, I, I'll, I, cause I track and I pay attention to my diet pretty closely, especially right now. I'll look and be like, Oh shit. Like I've <laughs> had like zero dirt, uh, dairy or anything in my diet whatsoever. Like this would be a good time for me to do that. Now, Sal is probably the most sensitive gut wise. So I know he, he's constantly like being told sensitive by sensitive Sal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His little tummy, mm. but I try and stay I'm just at, in tune. Okay. I, 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 I have, rub it for him sometimes. I have really good shits like all the time, and it's a Fantastic. it's a yeah it's an incredible process for me. <laughs> we should uh, we should do um, like a series on Instagram where we post our poops. Oh and, yeah, and then people can guess whose mm. poop is who. Yeah, that would <laughs> you be actually saying? fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, Justin's easy. Come That's on, easy man. to figure out. <laughs> you, know, you, the, th- you think it's that easy? Easy, huh? bro. It's yeah. stuck. It's stuck to the side. Well, <laughs> after you flush, bro, you know it's me. You know for sure yeah. because it looks like there was a, a car yeah. chase scene <laughs> with the going down. The, I wonder if the you just you have. S- such heavy shit. I think is that what it is? What it it's is. so heavy. It's that all his feelings. It's dense. all his feelings contained yeah. in his poop. <laughs> you gotta you carry in. all that in your body. I just gotta shit it out. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, every culture, every old uh, culture that's uh, connected to longevity has some kind of staple fermented food in it. Fermented foods are are quite important um, for to- overall health. One of the things that we lack in Western diets is fermented foods. Now, is this like a quality of life thing? Because it's like, this is the problem I have. Like, I've lived in California for six years now. And this is all this, this, like. Wait, where are you from originally? Originally? Canada. Canada. St. John's, Newfoundland. Okay. Is like Mm. born, grew up in Windsor, Ontario. So, like, southwestern Ontario, basically like Detroit, Windsor. Okay. Mm. So, is California like way more hippie than where you were from? If people drank kombucha where I'm from, they won't drink it for long. Like, it's just, (laughs) they don't last. There's no sushi. Okay. the, The second leading cause of death where i'm from is hitting a moose with your car okay like oh that wow. to give you a level of like where we're at on the hippie scale yeah, <laughs> yeah it just doesn't exist yeah but it's um we ain't about that yeah life. F- uh, fermented foods are very important for lot for overall health for mm. overall gut health yeah. and 
I mean, obviously, it's the way we evolved, right? We evolved eating all foods, and uh, we fermented foods a lot of times to preserve them. But what do you think the lifespan will be? How long do you think you'll live for? Oh, I, th- I see. What do you mean? Like, like I mean, like how I'm much all... is it going to add to your life? So don't... Yeah, like, okay, I mean, that's so... the question. Is it quality or quality? No, okay, exactly. Well, that's what it is. So it, to me, like, and we talk about this on the show, is that it's not about doing certain things to increase your lifespan. It's more about in- increasing... Uh, your your current life right now as far as overall health. The quality. Yeah, the quality, quality of your life right okay. now. Because when you, I tell you what, when, when my stomach is all right, like I, I, like I said, I'm shit very well and it's very regular and normal and it doesn't bother. When my diet is off, like that one of the first places that my body tells me is my stomach. Like yeah. I get gassy, I get bloated, my shits are uncomfortable. Like, I mean, and, the, and those type of things, I think a, a lot of Americans take that shit for granted and don't really pay attention to it. They just think it's just normal. Do you know how big the mark, and then you're just talking about gastro issues. And that's the thing. Yeah, of like, course. The gut has, that's a very, go- con- that's a very easy one to read. Like, yeah. oh, I have diarrhea. Oh, I'm constipated. Oh, I have gas. Yeah. But uh, there's lots of ways that you can, you know, poor gut health manifests. Uh, skin is one of them. Um, autoimmune issues have been connected. Yeah. Um, of course, brain fog, and fat loss, and muscle building even. Those are for our, our fitness listeners. Um, all these things are connected to it, and if you look at the the, the typical Western diet, it ju- it does not it is not um, conducive to good gut health. It's actually the opposite. Everything's sterile, especially if you eat a high processed uh, diet. Yeah. Um, and then the amount of antibiotics, uh, both uh, real actual antibiotics that we're exposed to, that we get from our doctor, to the type of uh, antibiotic residues we have in some of our food, to things that are not necessarily classified as, as antibiotics, but have uh, antibiotic actions like glyphosates, which are the herbicides that they spray all over, mm. you know, GMO foods and stuff. So if you, for example, you spray glyphosates on bacteria, it has antibiotic effects. And so the gut diet, and they've been studying this now for a few generations, uh, where they'll look at the gut um, diversity of people, and it's getting less and less diverse. And much of the gut diversity that you get comes from your mother. So your mother has less diversity, then you have less, and then your kids have less, and so on. And we're seeing this huge spike in, in illness and stuff. So very, very interesting stuff. But yeah, fermented foods are very important. But it's not just dairy. Dairy is how we, most people will eat yogurts uh, and get their fermented foods from yogurts. But, yeah. you know, kimchi, sauerkraut, pickles, you know, um, kombucha, which is a Japanese fermented, you know, tea. There's lots of different types of fermented foods. I know in, I believe in Icelandic cultures, they will take fish and they'll, They'll like bury it and like ferment the hell out of it and then eat it. And it's supposed to be a staple food. And I know everybody makes a gross face because it sounds disgusting, but it's something that it's part of their culture and it has been for a long time. And when you examine these, these cultures that have really good, uh, that are old, first of all, and they eat their traditional diets and tend to have better longevity, or most of these cultures have better longevity than the typical Western uh, lifestyle. Um, you find these common practices and all of them. So like, you know, Chinese diet, traditional Chinese diet, Mediterranean diet, you know, uh, Northern European diet that had no contact with each other will have these similarities. And one of them is there's some kind of fermented food that they eat uh, on a regular, you know, semi-regular basis. It's pretty interesting. Now, do you think, I mean, you guys all eat healthy though, right? Like, do you think that at some point it's an overcorrection? <clears throat> I like, think, I, I, I think absolutely. It can I, be. I, and I'll yeah. tell you right now, I, you uh, can overdo anything for sure. When I first was introduced to it and I was like, oh man, it felt so good. Oh, so then I, what did I start doing? Having one like almost yeah. every day. Yeah. And then I caught myself like, oh shit, I almost had to have one in order for my stomach to feel right. And I'm like, that yeah. can't be right. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. so well, it's like gluten, right? Like yeah. that's the thing. Like if you avoid it forever, like that's not a solution at all. Cause if you get exposed to it, you're fucked. Yes. Mm. And we, we talk about this a lot too, right? Like different types of stresses. We uh, God, we just, I mean, Sal was speculating not too long ago and which was ironic because we ran into a, a doctor who just wrote a book on it about uh, dehydrating. Yourself. Yeah. About yeah. intentionally going without water for a while, which just yeah. sounds so insane because we tell people all the time, like you got it. You got We don't get enough <laughs> fluid, more fluid, more yeah. water, more water, more water. And I agree with that, that most people grossly under drink water, but 
you know, for someone who does drink it all the time, very regularly, it's probably beneficial for you to go without it sometimes. Yeah. So I think all stress intermittently is is uh, good There's for the place for it. Yeah. Well, isn't that? I mean, they say that true about psychological stress too, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, you got to imagine the parallels are probably one and one because right. uh, what's that stoic guy? Um, I mean, I'm big enough. I'll listen to Ferris's podcast all the mm. time, and he talks about basically think like go live homeless for like two days. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and then if you're fine after that, and it's like, well, if your girl doesn't call you back, then you know mm-hmm. life's not that bad. We bring it to the absolute worst it could be, and if you can manage that, then your day to day is like, oh, okay, right. Well, bad. I mean, you uh, new perspective. I mean, sure. modern Western societies have solved uh, <clears throat> some of the problems that have plagued humanity forever, right? Like mm. infection. Uh, childbirth, uh, you know, get injury, uh, acute illness. Like, we've solved a lot of this. We kicked polio's ass. We did. That, we, that and, was big. Yeah, and we've solved a lot of these things, and yet we have mental illness and anxieties and paranoias and all these interesting psychological issues that are growing. They seem to be growing. Um, and, of course, obesity, which, is, mm. which, which you know, is, is very obvious. And I think it's because we solved a lot of these problems, but we went so far in one direction that we didn't realize that there were these unintended consequences because the human body and brain did evolve under certain circumstances and conditions. And that doesn't mean you have to live exactly like that because if you did, you would die when you were 35 of you know tooth decay or something weird yeah. like that. But uh, because we evolved under these conditions, the human body it evolved to, to thrive with some of these stressors. And mm-hmm. if you don't introduce these stressors, uh, you have some problems. Fasting is a fantastic example of this. And they find that, and again, in all these old cultures, they all practice fasting in some form or another. And in fact, all the major religions have incorporated fasting in some way. I mean, the ancient philosophers talked about fasting and how it was beneficial for health. And now we know that when you fast and you do it properly, um, you you reduce your, your risk of things like cancer. Um, that you actually... Here's an interesting one that I read uh, not that long ago. When you fat, when when they do studies on prolonged fast, and these are with with healthy people, so they'll they'll fast people for like ten to fourteen days, which is very long. Don't recommend it unless you're doing it under the supervision of a professional. But they'll they'll do this with with uh, with healthy people. There'll be no detrimental effects on the individuals, but their livers will shrink like twenty percent, thirty percent. So the, their organ sizes actually shrink, and then when they refeed, their organs grow back to normal size. And what's happening is you're their bodies are literally killing off cells, and it's the older cells that they're killing. And when they rebuild them, you know, they, they stimulate stem cell production. When they rebuild the organs, it's like they're younger. Mm. And uh, now they're connecting that to reduced uh, risks of cancer. In fact, I know the FDA right now is reviewing the it's use part of, the protocol. Of, of fasting to be used as uh, an adjuvant therapy with chemotherapy because they, they have seen now, and I think all the way up to phase two, and I think they're in phase three trials of this, chemotherapy with fasting uh, reduces the need for the dose of chemotherapy. So like half the much, you know, I'll give an example. This is not, I don't know what the numbers are, but like half as much chemo with fasting far as effective or more effective than twice as much chemo without fasting. Have they done a control with ketosis? Ketosis. So here's the thing with ketosis. When they compare, so Dr. Walter Longo is comparing, uh, is is looking at um, something called, he, he calls a fasting mimicking diet. And when they do studies on a ketogenic diet against fasting, ketogenic diets provide some of the benefit, but not all. Okay. Fasting is actually far more effective um, than just the ketogenic diet for treating certain autoimmune issues like uh, Parkinson's, for example. Um, the problem is fasting, you know, when you're telling somebody who's sick, uh, hey, we're going to have you not eat for five. Well, heck, tell the average person to not eat for two days. Like, Good luck. Yeah. You're not going to get very, very good participation. So Dr. Walter Longo is looking at something he calls a fasting mimicking diet. And I don't know all the details, but what from what I've learned, it's something like 500 calories a day and it's mostly fats that you're eating and it's very, very low. And it's like for seven days and it, the, it's much easier to follow. And the benefits so far are the same from what they're finding to fasting. From like testing against cancer. <clears throat> testing against autoimmune issues okay. and all these other metrics yeah. uh, that they're testing against. Because like when they scan for cancer, like a PET scan is basically where is the glucose being like uptook in your body at a more rapid rate. And mm-hmm. that's sort of the cell proliferation mm-hmm. that they're like, okay, that's growing too fast. Yeah. So it's like, let's cut off glucose. So I didn't know if there was like a caloric dependency to that or if just like, no, just cut the cord. So no if calories. you cut, if you cut and there's a, I can't, I can't believe, I can't remember the name of the effect The was it the Warburg effect? I think it was identified a long time ago that cancer cells had the inability to 
uh, runoff of ketones. So they, they're defunct in that, in that sense. They're sugar yeah. monsters. And this yeah. is why when you do a scan, they'll inject you with glucose exactly. and then boom, they suck up all the glucose. Well, we, we actually asked, uh, we had Dom Diagostino. So Dr. Dom Diagostino, like leading researcher, ketogenic diet, he was the one that did all the, the, the training and research for the Navy SEALs. Uh, one of the questions I remember we asked him, and I don't think this is the one that's about to air, right? So we asked him, if you had someone close to you that got diagnosed with cancer, like what would that protocol look like right now today? Like yeah. what would you say? And he's like, ketogenic diet, fasting, and um, uh, CBD. So those three things were, he's Cannabinoids, like- Cannabinoids. Yeah. Uh, what else did he say? Hi, hi, um, the chambers, were they- uh, Hyperbaric. Hyperbaric chambers. But yeah, um, you know, but here's the thing with cancer. Cancer is very, very clever. So if you cut all the glucose out, mm. you will see, and this is, by the way, this is completely established. There's no debate. You will see, for the most part, tumor shrinking, in some cases, uh, complete uh, remission. But it's not a cure because cancer is very, very clever. Yeah. And cancer will produce its glucose from amino acids in your body. It'll feed off of gl- uh, glutamine. will feed cancer like crazy. Um, it, it'll, you, it'll, it'll figure out ways to feed itself sometimes, but you can definitely weaken it, yeah. weaken its ability by eliminating glucose. And here's another one, uh, re- reducing protein intake quite a bit. I mean, a lot of people think I'm gonna eat a high protein diet, low, super low carb, high fat to, well, you know, if I have cancer, no, all that protein will get turned into glucose. So you actually have to go like medical keto- ketogenic diet, which is like 90% fat and just enough protein to keep you from, you know, just to get the essentials, basically. So very, very interesting stuff, yeah. So, Jordan, what got you into the fitness industry? Uh, I mean, like, lifting or the fitness industry? I don't know. I'll start from the beginning. I used to play hockey back in Canada. I mean, okay. go, go figure. So I used to just train to get better in the off-season. Were and- you lifting back then, too? Uh, so I started lifting when I was 15. So I was like a short little fat kid. And then <laughs> oh, I swear to God, in the summer between the ninth grade and the 10th grade, so it's what you guys do different freshman, sophomore. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm still getting used to like the U S parlance. You guys are. Oh, trying. how does it go? Tell me how it goes. So we go ninth grade. Yeah. 10th grade. Okay. Do you want, do you want to know what's next? 11th grade, 12th. Oh, so no, no. <laughs> There's never any talk of like freshman, sophomore. Like I'm, I'm up at Stanford. Oh, after. Like, oh, oh I'm like a sophomore. I'm like, it's great. What, yeah. That's what great. grade are you in? Yeah, exactly. What grade? <laughs> well, it's in its first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and then master's and or PhD or whatever. Got it, got it. Um, yeah, so I started, <laughs> started working out for hockey when I was 15. I had a trainer through like a commercial gym. Now, I'm sure it's the same here because you guys are commercial gym, right? Mm-hmm. If you When you buy the sessions, you buy the sessions with the gym, not with the trainer. So mm-hmm. if the trainer gets gone, you're still, you your money's still locked in. Yeah, yes. so I was a real sports-specific guy. I played in the OHL, which is like the baseball equivalent would be like triple a ball. Oh, Got so it. he's a good player. I was like, okay, perfect. He kind of knows the ropes and we were doing all the, the calisthenics and the proprioception stuff. And I was a goalie. So i um, trying to get really athletic and fast and all that. And then he got canned and then another trainer at the gym sort of picked up, picked up my, my case, so to speak. And I got a text from this guy and I'll, random number. Didn't know what it was. Showed up like uh, whatever his number was. And he said, you're mine, bitch. And I was like, that was, the text. that was a text. And I was like, I literally got a message from my one trainer saying like, Hey bro, like things didn't work out a good life. Like, uh, sorry, they're going to pass you on. I don't know who you're going to go with. Good luck. You know, if you never need anything, reach out. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. And then I get like a text. I'm in class. You're mine, like, bitch. You're mine, bitch. And now, I mean, he's one of my best friends in the entire world. Now. <laughs> um, like I'm God's father to his third daughter. Okay. And, but he's, He's beast, like massive. I was maybe like 180 pounds, like pretty athletic. I could move a little bit by the time I finished with him, but my new trainer now, uh, Luke, he had no idea about hockey, like couldn't skate for his, if his life depended on it. And he's like trying to like get the ins and outs. And he's a smart, really like tuned in trainers from like the physiology and the biomechanics. Like, okay. Yeah. He pieced together a program that actually looked really similar to what I was doing before, but I would stick around. I didn't have a car. I would like wait after our sessions and he'd be like, Hey, do you mind like giving me a spot? And this guy was like, I mean, I've seen him put four up five bench for 10. Like, Damn. yeah, he's, ma- and he was like a 205 pounds. Shredded. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, shit. yeah. He's a specimen. Wow. Like, so when I got into, so I would hang out with him and like spot him until mom came and picked me up. It was embarrassing. Like he was cool. He had his own car. He lived in his own apartment. Like, fuck, this guy's the man. <laughs> and then after a while, he's like, Hey man, like, you want to just jump in? Like, like we'll do our workouts and then so I was doing like an hour like balls to the wall hit training and then going an hour like bodybuilder bro session it was like fuck and then our sessions expired but he didn't really have anyone to lift with and he needed a spot and all that he's like do you want to just like keep on working out but like keep it off the books sort of thing I was like yeah sure and then slowly like 
the calisthenics and the interval training just slowly fucked <laughs> off. And then he's like, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we get you so big that you don't have to move in the net? I'm like, fuck, really? And man, I went from, I mean, I, when I was playing juniors back in Canada, I mean, I, they had this like website with all the stats and I was the heaviest player in the league. Nine teams, two conferences by like 20 pounds. Oh, like 245. shit. <laughs> In, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you went from 180-something? Wow. And this no? is over the course of years. Yeah. yeah, this is like two, three years working out with this guy. I mean, I was young when I started, and I played juniors when I was 19, 19 or 20. And by the time I got in to play juniors, I was, I was about 245. Like, it was to the point where we played this playoff game. And in the playoff series, the refs get the whole series, right? Same with Stanley Cup, same with uh, NBA Finals. The refs take on a whole series. Right. So they're, not, they're not traveling around. And so at the beginning of each game, we'd warm up at the red line. The goalies would go and stretch, and I would stretch right by the red line next to the other team, so like the center ice. And the other goalie did the Wait, same thing. intimidation thing, thing going on. Uh, here. You know, it's just, you know, just it's very mental. Like it's very like uh, ritualistic. Like goalies, if you've ever met a goalie if you're from Canada, like the better the goalie, the weirder they are. And like by a lot, I, I wasn't good, but I was relatively normal. Like. You weren't weird enough. I wasn't, honestly, I wasn't weird enough. Like, I couldn't imagine how strange the guys in the NHL are. Like, they must be just, like, I know a couple kids that went, went to the NHL, and it's like, God, those guys are weird. <laughs> like, they're cat guys. Yeah, they're cat they're guys. They're cat guys. <laughs> Best way to describe, like, NHL goalies <laughs> is they're everything. probably cat guys, yeah. Um, so I'd warm up, and, then, and we were getting, like, we're a terrible team, so we'd get our asses kicked. So game one, the other goalie comes up next to me, and we don't really know each other. They're from the northern division. We are from the south. And he's like, hey, you know, if, if they haven't pulled you by the third period, do you want to go? Like basically insinuating, like, we're going to get our asses kicked and do you want to fight? And just meet at center ice. What? Yeah. And like the refs kind of like, you know, they intervene the red line in warm ups to make sure that fights don't start before the game. And the ref was right there when, when the guy said this and he just laughed, like hysterically laughed because the refs warm up right outside of our dressing room. So I spend, I'll get half dressed in my gear, go out in like a beater with a tennis ball and just throw the tennis ball against the wall, try and like dial in a little bit. And so you get to know the refs a little bit. And the refs laughed when he heard that. And then he goes, I'll tell you what, kid. Go home. Go check this kid's stats, like height and weight. Because when we got gear on, we all look the same. Like, we all look the exact same size. If you still want to go next game, I'll tell the other refs and we'll let you go puck drop. I'll tell the other refs, don't let him go. Goalies are going to fight off the Oh, so he has no idea you're He has no idea I was 5'11", 245. (laughs) Right. And then I went home and I looked him up and he was like, maybe 170. Oh, and then, no. So, I mean, again, Poor goalies Jim. are really like ritualistic. So he goes to the red line the next game and I was like, oh shit, he grew some stones. And he just head down and the ref even comes up to him. So we doing this? Shakes head, you go online? Shakes his head, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, so he checks that? Yeah. And it's just nothing, not a word. No. I mean, we still got our asses kicked. And I'm like, fuck, I'll take any victory I can. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was, that was pretty much up until I moved here. It was just like very bodybuilder style training. But I mean, you age out in sports really quick. Mm-hmm. And you don't really realize it until it's like you're 21. And you're going, oh, fuck, I should have been in the NHL at 16 years old. No one told me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then I just kept training, training, training. And um, now as far as like the transition into the, like, call it the fitness industry. Yeah. Craig. Craig was my first introduction. No way. Well, that was how I you're first met me. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Me, and, me and Adam. Um, Craig, I used to work out with Craig. Um, he came here. Where did he come here from? Uh, New York, East right? Coast, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he came in here, and I was working out at the Golds in Santa Clara. But I don't know what the hell it's called now, but uh, American Barbell now. Sure. Um, and I was working out when it was when it was still gold. Even that like ages me a little bit. Like oh, back in my day, like. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember kids I was going to school with, like when I was in chiropractic college, like, oh man, that guy from like bodybuilding.com. And to me, he was just like, he's just another duster in my way at the gym. Like, <laughs> granted, Craig's a strong dude and for yeah. like a men's physique guy, like he's the branch warren of men's physique. Yeah. Well, this that's is how, great, that's yeah, a great he is. Good. He's just like, just goes for it. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I, there was times where I'd squat with Craig. I'm like, fuck man, this guy's like 500, like no joke. Yeah. Like, why are you wearing board shorts? Man? <laughs> um, but yeah, before I like met him, met him, he was just like, all the, all the guys from our school, like I'd go to him, like take pictures and all that. I'm like, fuck, whatever, man. Headphones in. And I, I pulled like the, hey, that was your last set, right? Yeah, yeah. He was like on something that I wanted to use. And right from there, he was like, I, f- I fucking like this guy. I got, <laughs> I got to talking to him and then I actually did online sort of fitness blogging for him. I mean, Craig, used Fire and Ice Fitness was one of his projects for a bit. So my last year of school, because um, he, he was bitch about it all the time. Like, oh, fuck, I got to like write all this content. And I was reading some of his stuff. I was like, Craig, maybe maybe let me take the wheel on some of these. And so every every Wednesday, it was it was to the point where I didn't even send it to him. He just gave me the login to the website, and I yeah. would put it right in the back. And awesome. that was my first exposure to it. And it was like 
I mean, I, th- I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have the practice I have. I wouldn't have the following and the online business that I have without him. Cause it's like, he really showed me the road. Basically I've come to realize every like bodybuilder, every person in the fitness industry is amazing at leaning their phone up against shit to videotape themselves or like <laughs> take pictures of themselves. Like all the bodybuilders have, Oh, let's take a picture. And there's no one around like, Oh, I got it. And there's like a protein shaker cup leaned up against some other thing. And the phone is like on a perfect angle. And there's a timer like three, two, <laughs> and like it's on Instagram like that. Um, so that was my first real exposure in, into like the fitness industry. And then, I'm, and Craig is the master at this because he's a one man oh, show. He is yeah. one of the most. So I, my experience, this is uh, I met Craig, like, I don't know how many years ago now, but through a mutual friend and I was a, even though I was in the men's physique bodybuilding world, I didn't hang out with any of them. I didn't connect with any of them. And I remember my buddy like trying to tell me like, oh, you're going to like this dude. You know, you guys are just like each other, yeah. this and that. And when he rolls up and I recognized him right away, I'm like, oh, I know I've seen this motherfucker before. Like, and I was like, oh, bodybuilding.com. That's yeah. what's happening. He's subliminal, man. He's yeah. fucking everywhere. Yes. When you realize you know I who know. he is, yeah. you're online, online and you're just like, yeah. you're on some random like, you know, ass Jeeves and Craig's like in the corner. Like, <laughs> yeah. Almost any, here, almost any time that I Google like a an exercise, a muscle or something like that, one of his images. That bodybuilding series. Yes. Yeah, I he's exactly all, all over everywhere, yeah. right? So so I recognized him right away. And then when we got to talking, I actually, uh, his business mind is what I was yeah. th- totally right away. I was like, oh, fuck, this guy gets it. Like, yeah. I am the same. I was like, I didn't think there was anybody else out there that got into this for the reason of building a business. Yeah, leverage I like, your status. Yes, exactly. Like yeah. it, I saw the writing on the wall really early that there's no money in it. Like yeah. it's and and to win a fucking plastic trophy, who gives a shit? Seriously. Like, so we, I, I met him, got that from him. We hit it off right away, and then I was blown away by like, man, this motherfucker does everything on his own. He videos, he edits, he writes all his content. So that's crazy. I did not know that was like your first real introduction into the fitness industry. Yeah, and it's funny because he and when we started working out together, he had mentioned you guys and mentioned the podcast. And no joke, when the first time I heard Mind Pump, it was my mid workout. He was telling me how how he was like going over to record with you guys and stuff. I literally, hand to God, thought he said Mind Comp f- podcast. I was like, <laughs> bro, 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 hold on. Like, Whoa, you dude. don't want that kind of association. I know you're not a history buff, but like, <laughs> I was like, wait, say that again. He's like, Mind Pump. I was like, oh, okay. It's like, I didn't know you rolled that way, man. Yeah. yeah, it was like, I swear to God, the it's first It's my time. story. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, geez, <laughs> my struggle. I like terrifying. to. Yeah, it's it just like, in German. Oh, that's not the association you want to be making, man. <laughs> not the best business move. So yeah, you talked about that and then I mean, learning to be a one man show from him and just kind of, I mean, we went down to the Fit Expo and I, just, I fucking hate Fit Expo. It's like oh the, the dumbest things like even now. You know what's well, funny? We So that's a hundred percent my experience with Fit Expos. I didn't get, I love the Paleo Fit, uh, the Paleo oh, yeah, Fit was. Wild. Oh God. Well, so that's because oh, you you're a hippie, bro. I that's cringe. why. I cringe. I died a thousand deaths. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you probably would. You probably you watched, watched, did you watch the video? I would eat one of them. Did you watch would, the video? Yes. I did. No, I watch, I watch your, I follow your story. Oh, yeah. I, well, I follow all you guys actually. Yeah. But like when yeah. you guys were there, it's just like, oh man, when the world, when the world ends, I'm eating those motherfuckers first. That's how that goes down. It's like, those are the week those are the ones <laughs> you kick off uh, oh man the paleo thing for me is just it's too much or do they have like strength and powerlifting conventions that are like that so no no well the nice thing is so when i you guys some, just aren't organized yeah it's it's weird we, uh, <laughs> like you're not good we at the whole get together yeah you so. got you're not you got powerlifters aren't good with the whole instagram and promoting they're getting thing. there it's i mean it's definitely but i think they're heeding the warnings yeah. of like they're learning from the bodybuilding community's mistake like mm. it's definitely mm. it's a really small group i mean there's a ton of people what was that like, whole juggernaut like that whole, uh, geez, like, i mean community? that's business man. yeah that's those business, guys yeah. so like they've they've assembled like you know, they try and cover everything. They have a right. couple PhDs. They have a mm. you know, physical therapist. Quinn Hannock runs like a clinical athlete. They, they're they organized. Like they are, uh, as far as the subculture goes, they're probably one of the most recognizable because they branch out. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they're big in USA, uh, USAWs, US, USA weightlifting. Uh, they got the nutrition stuff. You know, they're all like production quality and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they're down in Orange County. Uh, but yeah, back to the expo thing. Yeah. Powerlifting involvement in the expos is like they'll compete. Right. Like, so I competed 
in the Arnold Classic Australia. That's right. at the Arnold Classic Australia Expo. So it's like the the main stage is there, and then you got the chicks selling protein or whatever the fuck, and then powerlifting <laughs> off to the side. But man, we were we were the main event because yeah. it's like oh wait, these guys are doing something. Well, that's uh, yeah. You're, it's, to me, when you go to those expos, that's the most intriguing part yeah. is the the powerlifters. It's yeah. like I have something to watch. Like I don't want to stand. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been my experience. Is like, what are they even doing? Like, you don't do anything other than stand there and you know, well, yeah, you like, gotta wait hold in line for Rich Piana, yeah. right? Oh my like, god! Oh my god! Oh, did you see his that whole? I a, did, and oh, I mean, that should have character. surprised no one. It like, that's Billy Bush on the bus, man. Like, yeah. everyone knows that conversation <laughs> happens. Like, to me, that was like, well, yeah. yeah. Fuck, did you think Duh. this guy was like marching on Salem? Like, yeah. are you fucking serious? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my oh, god! I mean, it, it's funny because he set up like, I mean, he's everywhere. I. When I competed in Australia, I literally got on the platform before just to like kind of get my bearings. And I'm like, if I can see that fucking five percent banner when I'm lifting, that's gonna throw me off to no end. And like, lucky, it's the, the biggest fucking it banner you've ever seen in your life. It's man, if I was a parole How much officer, be, oh I would just God. like post up there all day <laughs> and just do like my check ins there because every fucking <laughs> neck tattoo, de- like degenerate, uh, like is that's out on steps is in that fucking line. Like yeah. he's <laughs> such a jackass. Well, which oh. is even crazy to me that like you said, like why? I mean, the fact that people are getting so surprised about it, it's just like come. Come on, dude. Yeah. What would you think? Like, and but I, well, it's surprise. I'll tell you why it's surprising because people sometimes forget that there are some people that talk like that. Sure. I mean, and, and it the very fact that it's surprising, I think, is a good thing because if it wasn't shocking, that'd be a little more telling. Then why are you following him if you know? It'd be a little more telling. But he's I mean? not Donald Sterling. Like, he's not like an eighty-year-old yeah. billionaire. Yeah. But it's at the same time, it's like you gotta you gotta see the writing yeah. on the wall. But and he's just thought- looking weirder and weirder. The guys, it's like more, is it more and more synthol or what's going on there? You know what, man? I go back and forth and now I think I've, I've swayed to my final decision on him is like, I initially thought, I'm like, fuck, what a businessman. Like he saw such an opening in a market for this un like unrepresented or underrepresented, like following, like how many, how many gyms around here and maybe not so much, but you go to Monterey road. No, there's a lot, there's a lot of five percenters around for sure. It was, I think I, that's what I saw. I saw the business side. I was like, and I hope that that was it. Yeah. I hoped it was, I hope he sat around in a room with his wife and dogs and he goes, man, like believe these fucking guys are eating it up like crazy. (laughs) But I think the authenticity was the selling point. The fact that he didn't have those closed door meetings and be like, all right, this is what we're going to do. I apologize in advance for all the dumb shit I say on this next episode, but man, we're going to get like, this is going to go viral. Watch. But I think like, that that forethought wasn't there. Yeah. I think it was off the cuff. That's really who he's he is. He's genuinely just an idiot. You think? Yeah. I don't, honestly, <laughs> it's like I think that goes to prove it, man. Like yeah. if that is in your head, I don't care what you're on. If you're drunk or on drugs, like yeah. that doesn't exist. That, that is not in any of us. Like if we sat here and smoked peyote, like <laughs> there'd be no way we'd be like uttering racial epithets right. within no. like 10 minutes of right. being high. Mm-hmm. So it's like, that's in there. And I we, only do that to my friends who are that race. Absolutely. <laughs> you know and to I mean? their face. Like my, yes. And in, yes. Yeah. And in good humor. Yeah. Like you're not going to pull a Bill Maher on Mind Pump. And no, start, no. Right? Oh like God. going like, what was Kramer? Remember when he did that? <laughs> oh, it ruined him. God, at like, the Laugh House in LA. Yeah. That was crazy. Jeez, well, I just think, ruined his whole career, man. But then, I mean, he was a, he was a reputable character to start. Sure. I don't know if this is going to affect. Well, he smacked around that freaking uh, that one uh, yeah, special that kid, needs the, dude, right, yeah, and Order that really didn't do much kid. to him. But because yeah. think of the following, right? exactly. I don't That's think it, what I think. It's I don't like, think it'll affect much. I mean, even the. I mean, he's got you know, like African American guys in his crew or yeah. whatever, and. I'm sure they're okay with it to some extent, like because this isn't the first time they've heard it. I'm sure, like right. no one's like, "Oh my god, yeah." <laughs> yeah. yeah. So to me, it's like you know, it won't affect us. I don't think it will either. Right? I think a lot of people thought it was was going to, and I'm like, ah, I no. don't think so. No. Actually, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he's got a lot of people that are kind of think that yeah. way themselves. Well, look yeah. when Trump does dumb shit, yeah. right? Like <laughs> he's still the president, and like when he said those things in the like any publicity is good publicity, right. I guess. If you're following his bunch of idiots. Well, so I see this trend happening right now, which annoys the fuck out of me, is I actually think a lot of these, this beef that goes back and forth, it reminds me of, you know, Tupac and Biggie back in the days where, you know, the East Coast, West Coast thing is like, I'm starting to see that in the fitness industry where people are intentionally picking beefs just to get... Dude, it's classic classic advertising. It, It was mastered 
by Coca-Cola and Pepsi back in the yeah. day. Like when you create beef, you actually give people you you actually force people to take a side yeah. when in fact they would have never taken a side to begin with. So now all of a sudden, my two choices are Coke and Pepsi. Whereas before I had seven yeah. up and Sprite Well, I mean, and that's any good business follows religious tenets in my in my mm. estimation, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like if you if you set up the opposite, then it's de facto two options, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think mean, with the whole Piana thing, it's like He's not, it's not going to matter. And the beef, like Generation Iron too. I think we watched the fucking trailer. I oh, haven't seen it. I haven't seen, I, it. So I haven't seen it, but I've heard like whispers about this fake beef thing happening. Uh, what's the, what's his face? The guy that jumps real high. <laughs> you know, oh, fuck. He always does like online. I could see the wheel spinning. Yeah. Come on. You know who I'm talking about. I do. Bodybuilder guy or what is I, he's, he's, the guy well, he's just on, Jack like, for no reason. Yeah. But I mean, he's in good shape. He looks good, but he's oh, never stepped on that thing. Oh. accused of lifting like, like, oh, like, uh, no, not Castleberry. Oh, no, oh, not Castleberry. Castleberry. Oh, okay. oh, fucking what's his name? I Bradley Martin. Brad Martin. Oh, yeah. Jumps okay. real high. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. So he has, I, and this is just news to me, and I've just heard this sort of through the grapevine that he has like a fake beef with that Australian guy. Yes. Uh, okay. And it's all, I mean, it's all since like power lifters do the same thing. Oh. Are starting to do the same, but it's, but it's fucking playing. It's fast and the furious. It's playing for slips. <laughs> like they'll, what do you mean? They call people out and it's great. Now it happened last year to me. I was at, and it was all in good fun, but like they'll poke each other on Instagram and like, they'll put money down. Biggest total wins. Oh, wow. so it's, it, but that's it's, cool though. It, yeah, because yeah, there's cool. a pre, there's a there's a there's a precipice there. There's a there's a climax to that where it's well, like it's tangible. Yeah. yeah, it's it's. I mean, yeah. it's almost taking on it's like measurable. Boxing. There's something you can actually measure. Yeah. Like yeah. where bodybuilders would be objective. Like I look better than yeah, you. No, I you have don't. More followers. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah right. Exactly. Yeah, no, you got to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. So this is this is coming up now in powerlifting because I mean I don't know if you guys have been to a powerlifting meet. Yeah. Okay. I mean it's it's like being at the DMV with strong people. <laughs> like that's literally what pa- it is. It's from like a from a like a spectator sport. It's not. It is that, not right? spectator friendly. No, I mean yeah. so I mean, they're trying to implement like new ways. And what are they? What are they doing? So there's a new thing happening right now, and Australia is really kind of leading the way on this. Is a meat promoter uh, named Marcus Mercopoulos. So he's the one that puts on the Arnold Classic, and there's a lot of big lifters coming out, and all sort of under or thanks to him, I guess. So they're doing now. They're sort of spinning off because they're seeing the potential market for that head to head. So they're hosting a meet right now. And there's two things that go viral, right? Massive, massive guys lifting massive, massive weights. Ray Williams. Yeah. That took powerlifting into the mainstream. Mm. Like people can consent like a thousand fucking pounds yeah. to this guy. So, I mean, even if you play tennis, you're like, oh shit. So that <laughs> got traction. So what they're doing now is A, they're hosting big dogs. So this will be the second year that they'll ho- host big dogs in Melbourne, which will be no weight classes in the jungle. We don't give a shit. Oh, wow. Do whatever biggest fucking total wins. Oh, wow. So that's like, I mean, that's drawing that's in the crowd. Cool. And what they're adding this year is really interesting, sort of as like, I don't want to say like a sideshow, but maybe like a warm up act is they're doing something similar with with lifters that are known to be good, but have similar totals as other lifters, regardless of weight class. So oftentimes, like, there'll be a weight class above or weight class below each other, but they'll total around the same. And it's like, hey, you guys have eight or nine months. Do whatever you got to do. And there'll be like a versus. Yeah, come in as big as you want, and it's biggest total wins. No weigh-ins, no bullshit. Throw down, squat bench dead, three attempts each. Oh. So it's like, but that spun off. So last year there was two two bigger lifters, Jordan Wong and Joe Sullivan, who competed at Reebok Record Breakers just up in Dublin at uh, CSA. You guys know Burdick, right, Jesse? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So at Jesse's gym. Oh, okay. So Jesse, yeah, Jesse throws great meets and he was able to attract these two big lifters and they sort of got on an Instagram tiff with each other. And it was all in good fun, but there was, I mean, Jordan paid out 1500 bucks at the end, like cash, here you go. Awesome. Yeah. So now they're, now more guys are trying to take that on because A, I mean, it's good exposure, right? right. But it's not just petty fucking dick slapping on Instagram to right. get more followers. It's like, you know, that's got to drive your training. And, and like, now, you know. now are you seeing growth in the sport of powerlifting now as Huge. a result of something? Well, maybe not as a result, I think. But it's, it's, it seems to be growing a little bit because it felt like, because I, I wasn't a huge powerlifting follower, but I did buy... I think it was called Powerlifting Magazine or Powerlifting Power, USA. Power Magazine? Something like that. Yeah. And it, uh, the first issue I bought, I'll never forget, had Ed Cohen on it. Uh, Eddie's was, the man. I got his shirt in my bag. Really, yeah. He's a great friend. Oh, man. oh really? Oh, yeah. So he, he yeah. was like, the, he was the fir- my introduction to powerlifting and the guy just blew me away. But I think for a little while there with all the gear people were wearing, yeah. I think that kind of fucked up powerlifting for a second, right? It was its inception, right? Westside Barbell 
the single ply multi ply lifters because it was just like how much weight can we lift without actually lifting the weight. Mm -hmm. So powerlifting really started to take off when raw lifting came in. There you go. Yeah. So I mean, there's different classifications that I think a lot of people on the outside don't understand because I think they they go to that west side. Yeah, break that down so people understand. Sure. So mm -hmm. I mean, classically, what you're referring to, west side barbell, sort of was the the godfather, like the epicenter of of powerlifting. And I mean, I'm relatively new to this, but I've sort of, I've got the lay of the land a little bit. And I mean, they would wear, you know, squat suits, bench shirts and deadlift, which is still around. Like Blaine Summers is a big, uh, they call them geared lifting, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, you, you get five guys to hang you from a squat rack to get you into this massive suit that just compresses the hell out of you. So it's like it's it's major technology. Like it'll yeah. add some oh, yeah. serious weight to your squat. I mean, you have and guys. you have to learn how to use it because I know people who, for the first time, put on a squat suit or a bench shirt and yeah. they can't even hit depth because it's so yeah. fucking tight. It's ridiculous. I mean, it'll take for like an average bench shirt like three or four hundred pounds just to get the bar to your chest because it's it's basically like an elastic exoskeleton, mm -hmm. which would be and it's like canvas and there's so there's some single ply which is a, a lesser density or thickness or elasticity than multi ply. So multi ply is like. It's it's insane. These guys, you could probably like come in twelve gauge to the chest, and they wouldn't break the suit. Like it, some of it is like Kevlar woven. Like oh my god, that's so crazy. It have is. you ever seen people put these things on? Have you guys? Ever I seen have them? seen yeah. the guys yeah. put them on. It's, it's like an. It's like, it takes two or three guys yeah. to help them put and it on. Some you get exhausted yeah. trying to put these on. But they have to like percolate into. The, I literally trained out at a gym where guys did this, and like the straps go over the shoulders, and there's Velcro, and that's sort of how you tie the whole thing together. They'll put the straps on, and they'll put the squat rack, the monolift up. They'll put the straps around the bar and hang from the bar. Just slide away. It's yeah, but it it's, it's so an hour. Dude. It is the strange. Like I walked in and I was like, and there's like chains the on the, of that well, there's even. chains on yeah. the wall. There's fucking bands. There's dudes hanging. I'm like, whoa, is there like a safety word in here? Or something? <laughs> it's fucking strange. <laughs> you got a ball man. gag in there. Yeah, What's going exactly. On? Oh, shit. So like that was kind of its yeah. inception was that, but as it broke away in the past, like I don't know, maybe ten years or so, towards like raw lifting, I think, and with social media, it helps as mm -hmm. well, right? Because what that exoskeleton suit that you put on when you move for raw lifting and you're trying to bi lift big weights, that has to be muscle. So there's there's an aesthetic component to the growth of powerlifting for sure because I would say the most popular lifters are the 220, 242, 198 guys where, I mean, there's a principle of diminishing returns. Oh, I hear what you're saying. With putting on weight, yeah. right? So it's like the guys in the 242s and the 220s, they're fucking cartoon characters, man. Like a lot mm. of times if you sprayed mm. them up, mm -hmm. walked them across the expo floor and put them on stage with the bodybuilders, like – they look like freaks, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? So there's, there was that trade-off for that transition between like, you know, putting on an accessory to get you stronger and then, oh, like maybe if we just did more mm -hmm. like accessory movements, we'd get stronger. Now you I, have to change, do you have to change or explain how you your, your form changes with gear versus without gear? Because I've seen people squat, like their, their, mm -hmm. their legs go way out yeah. when they're, when they got the squat suit on and. I think the only lift that the gear doesn't make a big difference is the deadlift, is if the I'm deadlift. not mistaken. Yeah, right? and yeah, and you won't see that change much with with a with a suit on because a lot of times the guys that lift in gear and there's weight classes just like anything else, mm -hmm. but it favors heavier guys because they can use more of their leverages uh, in the suit. That makes oh, sense. But heavy weights tend to do poorly on the deadlift regardless. It's the center of gravity thing, right? Like if our center of gravity is anterior of like of our lumbar spine, oh, I you see. have a big, but like if Ray Williams, the 1,062 squat or raw. Probably deadlift's probably way less than that, yeah? Yeah, I mean, he's like maybe cracking 800, oh. but it's that diminishing. So I actually crunched the numbers on this. 75% of the biggest deadlifts of all time were done by the 308s or lighter. 75% of the biggest squats of all time were done by the 308s or higher. Mm. So it's like the best deadlifter in the world. I mean, Eddie, Eddie did 901 at 220. Yeah. Two hour weigh ins. Yeah. So that was actually just broken maybe a month and a half ago. Yuri Bell. That record lasted for a while. The yeah. long, it's the longest one that I know, um, that, that I know to still be, to still and be. Eddie effort. pulled sumo. So. Yes and no. He pulled a modified sumo. So like sumo basically is designated by a hand position relative to the to the legs, right? Hands inside, con hands inside sumo, hands outside conventional. Um, but there's there's degrees of that. Like a lot of the top name guys that'll pull sumo pull like toes to plates. Eddie was like a very neutral stance mm -hmm. sumo, so it was like his his knees were just outside his elbows, sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, but the guy that just broke his record, Yuri Belkin, this Russian guy, he goes like toes to bar and she's just a technician like there's a lot a lot of moving parts to his to his technique mm -hmm. um but yeah but yeah you're see you've seen some of those shifts in powerlifting to where 
Raw um, now is more popular than mm-hmm. Geared. Yeah. And that seems to have made it grow. Um, and I also think what I've seen from the bodybuilding kind of cosmetic aesthetic world is that they're starting to finally uh, really appreciate the muscle building effects of training like a power lifter sometimes. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the past, you didn't really, I mean, in the, in the, in the seventies, you saw a lot of it and then it kind of fell out of favor. Yeah, there was a stark separation between the two. I, I, there was a while there where bodybuilders didn't squat and didn't deadlift at all. They yeah. just didn't do it. And it that, like and then machine based. And Coleman, you know, Ronnie Coleman was a big squatter and deadlifter and he kind of broke down, and you look know, where he's up. And yeah, actually, yeah, right. yeah exactly. so look at Dexter Jackson. Yeah. A guy who goes on record and says, I'm a bodybuilder. Don't need to squat and hasn't squatted heavy in decades. Yeah. He's six years, if I'm not mistaken, he's six years junior to to Ronnie, mm-hmm. right? And Ronnie, yeah, buddy, 800 pounds, two weeks out from Olympia. Yeah. Everyone knows he's got the tight. So that was single ply. Oh, okay. That was a single ply suit that Ronnie had when on. He did his he, yeah, that pounds Metro spot. Flex, everyone fucking knows that video, mm-hmm. right? But let I me mean, look at that. Like, look at the denigration that that did to him. He's he's five surgeries in in the last three years. He's got nerve damage. I saw him in Toronto damage. last year in a wheelchair. Damn. Right? And what's Dexter doing? Dexter sweeps the Arnolds last year. Yeah. Goes across the world, wins every yeah. fucking one. Well, I see, and here's what I was just going to say now is I think they're starting and now with powerlifting, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I see you being a part of this wave is in powerlifting, you're starting to see more people understand mobility, mm. accessory work, and correctional exercise, whereas powerlifters before, like correctional work, mobility, what the hell's yeah. that? <clears throat> well, you talked about like the difference in training between uh, like the geared – and and the raw lifting yeah. and i think i mean i could go on for days but there it forced them to because if you try to squat like a gear lifter without gear it's an anatomical and biomechanical nightmare mm. so i mean i don't want to get too too in depth with it but like think of the position of the hips right like if those feet are pointed to either side of the room if that's a representation of rotation of the hips Right. So if that is full external rotation of the hips, how are you going to generate any torque from a length tension relationship with that mm-hmm, muscle? Right. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. The torque isn't general. You just push yourself into this into this exoskeleton and that sort of has your back, so to speak. Another thing, the cue and fuck, I don't know if powerlifting is to blame or it's NASM or, you know, shitty certifications or CrossFit squatting, yeah. squatting, the mm-hmm. sit back cue and squat. I mean, as a chiropractor, <laughs> sit back all day. I'll pay off my student loans for people who sit back <laughs> in the squat. But if you think about like mechanics of the SI joint, like that's, they were fine because that, that thoracolumbar fascia, that lumbopelvic region was it totally stabilized because on top of this, you know, Kevlar suit that they have on that's compressing them in, they have a, you know, a two prong fuck 10, 12 millimeter belt on top of that. So mm-hmm. low back is fine if they can keep that spine directly under the bar. Mm-hmm. So what they try and do is with a low bar position, they need to sit back to keep that center of gravity sort mm-hmm. of appeased. But the second you do that without that suit, so if your hips are flexing forward, if your pelvis is anteriorly tilting, that's your basically each ilium that your hip, your hip uh, sets in is going like this. But if you think about the gait cycle, like when we walk and we put our leg in extension, so that lag leg when you're walking, that's anteroversion of the pelvis, right? Mm-hmm. So they move independent to one another. Mm. So if anteroversion leads to flexion or extension rather of that femur, you're going to tell people to sit back, so anterovert, which would set a trajectory for extension, and then you're going to flex through that. Mm. So that's when people get like, uh, FAI, like hip impingement stuff. That's part of the reason there. And then sprained SI joints or like uh, spondylolisthesis L5-S1. So you said hip impingement. Is that when, because uh, I've had this happen in the past and I figured out ways to help clients correct, work through it and correct it. But I'll hear some people say like, oh, I feel like it's my hip flexor when oh, I'm squatting. Yeah, which one? Uh, uh, what do you mean? There's like eight or nine muscles that flex the hip. Oh, okay. Well, that's what they yeah. say. Yeah, no, no. And that's and that's what I say back to them yeah. because it's the ambiguity of that designation. Yeah, they'll just say, I feel it here. It feels yeah. like my hip flexor. Yeah. When in reality, what I identified many times was just a hip. It was a hip issue. It had to do with the, uh, that, what, yeah. what you're saying. Tilting so instead of saying sit back, because I think when I tell people or when I've told people in the past to sit back, what I'm trying to tell them to do is not necessarily sit back, but just to adjust their weight. And I think what people understand is anterior tilt. Yeah. Like when you say sit back, they say they think stick butt out yeah. and yeah. arch my back, yeah. which is then what causes a lot of the issues. So what how, what are the cues that you would use then instead of that? For like a power lifting, yeah, or like just a low for, bar squat? Yeah, or just, just as someone who's squatting and you want their... Well, well, I think the dogma is squatting is bad for your knees. I mm-hmm. think that's where it started. And yeah. I think from that extrapolated out uh, certifications and, and coaching that, mm-hmm. that all went to protect the knee. Uh-huh. And it's like... 
to me, it started with emotion and, yeah, and everything else. Well, it started yeah. with one study, 1955. And this is the problem with research when bad research gets in because it just circulates because someone can cite it and then someone checks it out. And it's like, okay, yeah. But it's like, if you don't fucking, if you just read the PubMed abstract and don't like, research is like, like religion, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you can either follow to a T or you can interpret it. Mm. If you think a guy lived in a whale for two days and then lived, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> there's an interpretation to be had. There's an understanding that like, okay, that probably didn't happen, but what's this trying to tell me? Mm-hmm. Right. Now it's the same thing with research. If you just go off of it, like word for word dogmatically and go, oh, this research out on this, I'm going to abide by this, this new tenet of God, research. That sounds like some people we've had on our show before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> God. Um, like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lane Norton. No. <laughs> clarify. Um, but yeah, so the study was 1955. This guy, Carl Klein, did a study on, he basically used a goineometer. So like a, the measuring stick, mm-hmm. a compass to measure yes. degrees of mo- movement of valgus and varus at the knee. Mm. And the control was just people walking down the street, non-athletes, and they took Olympic weightlifters immediately post-competition. Now, there's a few things wrong with this from the get-go. It's like... Well, yeah, if you took those people off the street and you just squatted them full depth with a bar over their head, they would have more mobility in their knee just forced on it with because they're just walking on the street otherwise, right? So from that, he obviously found more valgus and varus motion through the Olympic weightlifting study, the deep squatters. And now, said, can you explain to our listeners what, you're, what you mean oh, by valgus? Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, valgus would be like knees in. So like if you put your, if you put your leg up on like a table, and mm-hmm. then someone grabbed like a, their put their hand on the inside of the thigh and the outside of the shin and mm-hmm. pushed that way. That would be valgus. That would okay. be pushing the knee into valgus and the opposite. So if you took that that quad hand, put it down on the inside of the shin and the other hand on the outside. So of basically, the, you're saying knees flaring out or flaring exactly. In when you squat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he tested them unloaded afterwards and basically looked for laxity, which he found. Obviously, I mean, we'd find that now even if we used ourselves as a control sitting here in the studio, if we measured our amount of valgus and varus laxity. And we went out, and took it to the. It's bar just the well. amount of the amount of give or move exactly. The joint. But so from that, he surmised that you know, a few things: a that there was more. Okay, but he made a false equivalency and not found it anywhere else in research that that laxity would lead to an increase in injury. Mm-hmm. There's no proof of that anywhere, mm-hmm. and the study's been reproduced. But you you can't retract it once it's out there. Mm. And I mean, it was done so long ago, it's been perpetuated. And, and so from men. there, they're like squats, bad for the knees. Bad for the knees, yeah. yeah, which is not, I mean, not at all the case. Like, not not at all the case, but when programmed or when cued correctly, like, no, they actually show in, is if you have the hip stability for deep knee flexion, that's actually great for your knees. Mm-hmm. The compressive moment is at that 90 degree where they're telling you to stop. That's it. actually the worst yeah, part to stop. Yeah, that is the worst part right. to stop. Um, so if, back to your question, if I was to cue like a powerlifting low bar squat, I mean, I could really go, I could go for days just on this. But <laughs> I mean, I try and keep the pelvis underneath and break in the knees first. So like descend in the knee, like initiate the movement with the knees, then go straight down, then sit back at the bottom. Mm. There is, with the low bar position, there's an inevitability if you're trying to appease center of gravity and make it an efficient movement. Mm -hmm. Because when you're vertically loading, biomechanics and physics is the exact same thing. It is the exact do you, same thing. Do you like how Ripto teaches a squat? No, the guy's a fucking crack. I was wondering. The guy <laughs> oh, is no. such a crack. No, I mean, that's whatever, man. We, he's like he's like Jesus in the uh, strength. In the strength uh, yeah, oh, but no, because no, it's it's the dumbest thing in the world because he'll do starting strength meets, right? Like, yeah. Which is they take out the bench press and they put an overhead press. Yeah, let's start someone off with an overhead press. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. And put them on yeah. a stage in front of people that weigh them in mm. as they leave and then see if they, how many like lumbar spines you fuck up. You can't <laughs> correct for that spinal stability in a full overhead position. Mm. I mean, I had no problem going after that guy. <laughs> it's just, I mean, there are people. This pe- is why we like you. <laughs> I mean, I nothing, everything works. Nothing works every time. Mm-hmm. But to me, like, I, I take a very, like, pragmatic, like, anatomical, biomechanical approach to it from, like, an injury prevention standpoint. That's mm-hmm. everyone's real rate limiter. I laugh at powerlifters when they'll come off a of meet. I mean, they, like, blow out their SI joint. And then when they start programming again, it's like, oh, you know, i got to build up the quads this off season. I'm going to front squat a lot or safety bar squats. Like, dude, your rate limiter isn't your quads if you're limping off after your fucking second attempt and not taking a third. Why don't you focus on stabilizing that SI joint first? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could do fucking, you know, uh, hack squats or lunges or whatever and build up the quads that you want. But if you're not in a stable enough position to express that strength on the platform, guess what? All that's for naught. And the the funny thing is that this is paradigm shattering, mind blowing what you're saying to a lot of people who are in the strength world, which... If you really think about it, I mean, it makes perfect. It makes 
perfect sense. I mean, as personal trainers who've like, I've, I've worked with a lot of high end clients and a lot of the work I did was what you're talking about. Yeah. It wasn't develop this, develop that, build that. It was develop stability, mm-hmm. work on control, work on range of motion. Mm-hmm. And then all the other pieces kind of fell in place. And then all of a sudden we're getting a lot out of the exercises that we're doing. And I, you know, I'll never forget as a personal trainer in the early days, we were taught certain exercises you shouldn't do ever. Mm. We were taught don't ever do anything behind the neck. Don't ever bend b- b- more than 90 degrees at the elbow. Don't ever bend more than 90 degrees at the at the knee. And then as I started, you know, as I got older and gained more experience, I really learned that really what it's all about is if you can move with good stability and good control, then that movement's okay. I don't care what it is. If well, you have good stability you, and, and control. And if you can't, you should work to get there. It shouldn't just be like, oh, fuck it. I can only squat down to 90 because that's as far as I can safely go. Right. You shouldn't and just I mean, all settle that stuff, for that. It's devoid of any assessment, which is, which is, I guess, a lot of what I do and what it hinges on is like, you just said, you brought up a great point about behind the neck. No, nothing ever behind the neck. Yes. Yeah. Dude, if you're Superman and you have clavicles that are foot and a half long and your shoulder motion is great behind the neck relative to that deltoid that you're trying to isolate. Yeah, it's fine. You're fine. If you have this, the ability to retract and depress the scapula to set that trajectory and that trajectory just happens to be where your fucking hand is behind your head, then yeah, go for it. Do mm-hmm. a lot of people have that? Probably not. No. Yeah. And that's just it. Like I met years ago, I met a gentleman who was, he was either 70 or in his late sixties. I can't remember. But he was a high-level gymnast mm. in his early years, and he was a smaller guy, still worked out, and I was blown away, first of all, by his development, his muscle development, but by his mobility, incredible mobility. Now, here we're talking about a gymnast who's go- who you know trained in ranges of motion and movements that I was taught yeah. don't do. They're, they're totally, unnatural. They're right. unnatural, and they're bad for you. Right. And that was kind of the first clue, and I'm like, wait a minute. If you can move, like I'll give you another example. If I take... 15 people off the street right now here in America and I tell them to sit in a squat, they're going to look terrible because nobody does that anymore. When in reality, sitting in a squat, if you do it and you practice it since you're a child, it's one of the most natural things we do. That's how humans took a shit, you know, for for most of human civilization. And now you sit in a squat, knees hurt, back hurts, ankles hurt. Well, you fall problems. over. Most people can't do it without falling yeah. over. You try yeah. and if you force yourself down in that position. Exactly. So really it's about that control and stability. And it's crazy because in the world that you okay, your expertise is obviously in movement and mobility, but you compete in powerlifting and uh, you must be blowing people's minds when you're talking yeah. like this. Um Yeah, it's just I mean, it's just shining light on it. I think a lot of them they have they have a mo- there's this preconceived notion that mobility and I think it comes from that West Side method that like you need to be as just flexible as you want to be because there's, you know, there is an elastic property to muscle, right? Mm. And they think that if you can springboard off that, that, that's that exact, tightness. yeah, that tightness, right? And it's like, yeah, but like that's how, she, that's how you tear. That's your shit. highest risk yeah. when yeah. you're like that. <laughs> so and my biggest thing is like, you know, I take guys that squat 800 pounds, 900 pounds, and I put them on one leg. Can you, like, I challenge you, can you put, put your socks on in the morning, standing up? One at a time. See if you can do it without like fucking falling back on the bed. And they can't do it, right? So I'm like, if you can't stand on one leg, don't fucking squat with two. You don't have the <laughs> stability for point. it. It's just, I mean, it's it's been glaring for so long. But it's, I mean, so when I when I present, when I do my seminars, I I, I put up that equation, right? And I ask people like, what's when you squat? What do you think the percentage breakdown is per muscle group? Like, how much are your squat squats? How much is hamstrings? How much is mm. core? How much is upper back tightness? How much is lats? How much is dorsiflexion? Whatever. And I get percentages, and I put it in a nice bracket. Put it up on a board, nice bracket, and I say, okay, all right, let's start. Say you come off a of meet, and then you you know you think your quads are weak. Okay, let's say that potential thirty percent is on twenty five. So I go through the equation. I do all the math inside the brackets, and the brackets are key because if anyone who knows math and order of operations, because at the end I draw a little unicorn. I draw a little, <laughs> little unicorn on the outside of the brackets. And now you need to give that unicorn a value because that's like, oh shit, I can't bench three times a week going to the meet because my fucking elbows hurt because I blow bar squatted yesterday. I have no external rotation. I'm torquing the shit out of my elbows. And I can't realize why I can't fucking bench, but I'm going to hammer my triceps because I'm, I'm inside this bracket. I'm inside this bracket and I'm trying to get my triceps stronger for my bench. Oh, but it's analogy. like, dude, you can't fucking, you can't, you can't bench three times a week going into a meet. You're fucking useless. Right? So let's, 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 let's identify this unicorn first, because when you give this a value, say that. That that denigration of not being able to train at a high frequency or high intensity peaking for a meet puts you at 0.5. 
go out and like, okay, maybe I'm 30% on my squat, but uh, I've only got like 28 on my quad. So 28, and then you do the math. So I'm like, okay, so I'm like 79% of what I could be with all my muscle groups. So I get everything up. It's like, yeah, but if you times by 0.5 on the outside of this fucking magic unicorn, all of a sudden, all that goes to shit, right? Your 600 pound squats now of the 400 pound squat. Mm-hmm. That's your biggest potential for increasing your strength. But you need to identify it and you need to see the writing on the wall because everyone thinks squat bench dead. Oh, it's such a balanced sport. Fuck no, it's not a balanced sport. <laughs> it's the most like internally rotated, dominant upper body sport. Deadlift with your lats, bench with your pecs. Okay, both of those are internal rotators of the shoulder. Then get your shoulder in the most externally rotated to and squat. extended low bar. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, no shit. I mean, there's so many pitfalls designed into those three lifts, especially in combination and in succession, mm-hmm. that it's like, it just takes a different prism to look through. So I think I just got into the sport at the right time as I was going mm-hmm. through sort of, I mean, I finished up with um, exercise science and public health degree, went into chiropractic college. So I was squatting at night with powerlifters and then I was cutting up dead bodies in the morning with like in my anatomy class. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> this attaches here? Yeah. Oh, I got to tell everyone about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stop. It's like, it's like all the dots together. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, that's what it was. Yeah. And like that to me, like just the cadaver lab and all that, my training was exponentially more efficient after that. So, oh, yeah. Do you consider yourself kind of like a um, like a, a nerd a bit? Do you do, do you geek out on that stuff when you when you learn? Oh, can it? you hear him talk? Well, yeah. no, that's why I'm asking. I feel like you. Uh, <laughs> he's like Beast you from X Men. He's Beast. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great he's name. Like, he's, that's a neat name. He's for a you. big yeah. muscular beast. Were you he's always a like this, or was it blue. was it uh, when you started learning at this, you started diving deeper and deeper and just enjoyed? I so when I so when I started training with Luke. My buddy, the guy's like, let's just get you massive. He, there was no learning curve. He's he's still to this day, when there's something I can't figure out, I'll message him. Like, he's just, he's a savant. Like, he's mm-hmm. just. Mm-hmm. He, his, Very growth minded. His physical literacy is unbelievable. Like, you talked about proprioception yeah. yesterday. And straight, to have that at his size and his ability to just internalize. Because, I mean, I look at it this way. And this is a little bit of an aside. And this is probably one of the driving forces of why I work out. Like. Think about like your senses, right? Like your ability to touch and smell and and hear and all that. Try to think. Try to think of a color that you've never seen before. Yeah, you can't do it. No, you can't conceptualize it. Yeah, but now let's think of proprioception, kinematic awareness, physical literacy as that sixth sense. Like not Bruce Willis and the weird dead kid, but like (laughs) this is your that's your real sixth sense, right? Your ability to feel your body in space, Mm -hmm. and it's like I still when I go train. I can still feel things differently every day. And that's, I mean, that's tantamount to like seeing a new color every day. Holy fucking shit. Like that's, that's incredible to me. But so I totally forgot where we well, no, I mean, this, well, but that, that, no, that is clearly an intelligence. That's yeah. clearly an intelligence. There's a genetic component to it, but you can definitely develop it, yeah. uh, develop it. And if you look at sports that require the highest level of that type of intelligence, mm. that proprioceptive intelligence, look at sports like, uh, high diving or, you know, uh, gym, you know, gymna- rhythmic, you know, gymnastics. Yeah. I mean, where people are spinning in space and having to realize where they are so that they could make the smallest splash or whatever. Yeah. The way that they train is mainly that. Yeah. It's very little physical training. It's literally frequent, frequent, frequent training uh, for that particular type yeah. of skill. And so you can definitely develop it, but there's people who are born with an incredible ability to to know those types of things and know where their bodies are in space. And I think it makes a big difference as a trainer. But I think... You know, kind of along the lines of what we're talking about, uh, one of the worst things to happen in fitness that we still do th- that we still do is we put people into boxes and camps, and it becomes this competitive thing where if you're a mobility movement guy, well, then that means you're a yoga hippie person, and if you're a power right, lifter, you're crawling everywhere. Yeah, if you're That's a power lifter, you're a big strong dude with the beard, and if you're a bodybuilder, then you you know then all you do is you know body part splits and you eat like this and. They lose that crossover, and then you, from that you develop myths. Like, uh, of course, if you meet someone where all they do is static stretching, mobility work, and they look real lax, you're going to think, "Oh, that stuff must make you weak because this person looks weak and they look loose." But, but I think there's a genetic propensity to that 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 picks them, right? Because it like, definitely these, the yoga guys and the hippie stuff. And I'm not going to shit on kombucha because you you just drank some. But like that culture to me is like. That's not impressive. You have no appreciable muscle mass. There's no resistant force. That's, oh God, I mean, who listens to this? What's your demographics? Uh, like? Well, no, go with go. it. Well, no, yeah, listen, that's, that's, you're gonna, they need a check. That's a fat, oh yeah. God, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not going to say it's, it. right. <laughs> it's There's nothing, I mean, Jews in Auschwitz had abs, mm. right? 
There's like the 16 year old kid taking the selfie in the mirror with abs. That's not impressive. Just as the 145 pound spiritual yogi is, that's not impressive. You have no resistance for it. Give me like a 275 lifter that does his mobility work, is stable as fuck on one foot. That's impressive. Well, this is what prides me about what I do because I, you know, yeah. walk around, be a bodybuilder guy, can squat good weight. And then I also can do a lot of mobility shit. And I'm six fucking three, you yeah. know? So. I I said it on the show today. Probably made a more PC way to say what you're saying right now. In my opinion, everybody needs to be doing more of what they're not doing. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean that, and that's just it. Like the yoga, the yogis that are preaching about mobility and meditation. I'm the same way too. I'm not impressed by you because you know why, bro? You need to go lift some fucking heavy yeah. weight, you pussy. And you know who's just as equally to get injured on the other side of the spectrum? Yeah, right. Yeah. In- they're they're instable. Right, they're right, yeah. right. Right. Well, well, well and then flexibility the f- without stability is instable. Exactly. I mean, because I, mean, you know. I think the problem is there's the, the people assume a direct correlation. Yeah. Between instability and strength. Well, I mean, and, I mean, and this is true for any extreme on any endeavor. I mean, sure. you take a bodybuilder who does none of that stuff, yeah. and you've got a meathead who can't move and you know is injured and unhealthy or whatever. Yeah. And you can do this with all those things, but they can all learn from each other. And it doesn't mean you have to become that. No, it means you can get better at what you're doing. Well, they're in, inverted bell curves. Is how I look at them. Mm. Right? So you need to find that middle point where the likelihood of or you find your way somewhere in the middle. Regardless, I mean, if you're in the Cirque du Soleil, it's like man, maybe you should not like stretch as much or go go hit some weights mm-hmm. or let, you know. Yeah, totally meathead. different. When we're talking about sports because that's sports specific, right there, right? When yeah. When it, you, it, you have to be extreme. Yeah, when it starts, hand, which we all have said a million times too on the show, is that you know sports are not technically healthy for the body. But well, no, I mean, I would not advise getting into competitive powerlifting for health reasons. Like right. competitive, competitive. The the amateur weekend stuff. You want to hit PR, sure. sure. But like mm-hmm. the stuff I see on the inner workings of like you know, I've been lucky in the last year to compete on some pretty big stages, and it's just like holy shit, like, extreme. Yeah, it's extreme, but it's like that's but that I think. A, appeases more of a mental health thing mm-hmm. with those guys because that's I think that's really the driving force they don't do it to be healthy they do it to, to accomplish I, right? I don't think I, I don't think I think that's true for anybody who does anything to an extreme level yeah. And yeah. not just sports bodybuilding business yogi, all those things. I mean business is like that you like you want to achieve a super high level of performance yeah. in business you're something else is gonna something it's yeah. you're not balanced yeah. it's yeah. just the way it is and you have to accept it but you know it, it backed in uh, to the flexibility topic that you were talking about how people believed being tight somehow made you stronger. Yeah. What really blew me away uh, not that long ago was realizing that flexibility has less to do with this muscle that you can stretch like a rubber band and it's more to do with the central nervous system exactly. and it has, how, yeah. how it responds. Because I could take a client, and I've done this so many times, I'll take a client and I'll improve their flexibility within a 20-minute stretching session. Yeah. I didn't make their muscles any longer. I just told their central nervous system to relax a little bit. And so when you have somebody... Who and, and again, there's genetic components to this, and I've had clients like this as well, who come in, never work out, they're totally deconditioned, but they're so lax and so flexible that they can, I mean, they can squat bottom out, they can, you know, stretch their hamstrings, no problem, but they're so loose and weak, and people will attribute that to weakness, and no, it's just this person is deconditioned, their CNS is on the other side of the scale, other side of the scale where they don't have the CNS that fires to control it's just super lax and relaxed all the time well i think a lot of through that and it's something i talk about a lot is why you get tight right because i think in this spectrum we've created really linear a linear um like sort of polar opposites of mobility and and like flexibility mm-hmm. or uh, like in inflexibility or like tightness and mobility i yeah. guess is what i'm getting at but i mean i look at it more like a three three prong or three a three circle venn diagram because stability and strength are not the same thing Right. And I think understanding why joints get tight, because a lot of times they get tight to force stability on a joint. So I, this is a classic mm. example. If I were to give you a dynamometer, yeah. exactly. So if mm. I were to give you a grip strength measure here and have you put it over your head, where do you think the reading would be higher? Arms at your side or arm overhead? Oh, your side. side. Every muscle that controls grip, medial epicondyle and down. Of your, as nothing, it totally dissociated from the shoulder. But you have proprioceptors in the shoulder that talk to the brain that say, hey, in this overhead position, we're unstable. Don't load anything heavy in this. So kettlebell bottom under press is something we did last yeah. time I was around. Mm-hmm. And that's a great example. Like I can take a 35 pound kettlebell. I can go 300 pounds overhead. Like 35 pounds should not be shaky at the top. But it's in this most unstable structural joint position in that full overhead position mm-hmm. that the grip, it feels like, oh, my wrists are weak. That's one thing I hear a lot. It's like, no, it's not. Your shoulder is telling your brain, don't load 
pro, like distal to this instability, drop the fucking thing. That's why your wrist feels weak. God, what a great wow. video and explanation. That's such yeah. a that's such a cool point. Yeah, you just blew my mind right yeah, now. Yeah, no, that yeah. you are. I'm, I'm listening to you right now. I'm going like, wow, that's such a great. This is why it's so important to train in these different positions yeah, because in end range your brain strength. your your central nervous system literally is uh, think of it like a rev limiter but that rev limiter changes depending on the positioning of the body and the joint yeah. so you're going you can be so strong you could be like man i have the strongest biceps in the world mm. or i have the strongest quads in the world but in this position i'm i have half the strength mm -hmm. i lost a lot of that strength and so the key really is to be able to gain that strength and stability in all these different ranges of motion all these different positions because you, you know again real life you know, works that way you know this does remind me a little bit of like some of the bodybuilding culture that we're doing some things i felt that were good but they totally misrepresented it yeah like you'd see guys you know kicking their out flaring their elbows out really wide and doing these triceps and then they would be telling people that's developing a certain part of yeah. the tricep i'd oh, be the, like the I'd pectus like, this angle, yes, i would I mean, be hit, like you fucking the lower yeah. bicep but at the yeah. same time too then somebody might catch me doing a movement like that inside the gym and i'd be like well the difference is i'm not doing it to build a, a bice or buy up my peak of my bicep yeah. or my inner tricep or my, you know oh, that's my one of my favorite ones i do for my shoulder stability is is uh, like like crucifix curls like uh -huh. the high cable oh, yeah. curls yeah. Mm. because then you load that long head of bicep tendon as an anterior stabilizer of the shoulder everyone thinks i'm working on the peak it's like no i got, <laughs> got t-boned by a fucking suburban three years ago and had to mel gibson my shoulder back into place on the corner of dela cruz boulevard like this thing's got to be locked in and that long head of bicep tendon is going to do it i give a fuck about my the how big your arms are i have no idea i honestly could not tell you but. so <laughs> great dude see and this is what people need to hear and I, and I know I know there's people that listen to the show and then they see me in the gym and I know they see me doing things that I'm sure they've heard me talk shit yeah. about but the purpose behind why I'm using using a movement like that is completely different than the moron on IG yeah. that's telling people that oh this is what I do to work on this yeah. you know this is what I do to work on like no yeah, there's an mean. intent there yes. there's, and I think if you can't explain that intent like you shouldn't be doing it right. every exercise and it's funny because I, I mean or I'll, certainly not teaching it at least sure and yeah, that's, and that's the biggest to each their thing. own. If you want to go do weird shit with your body and do weird that's, shit, that's but you shouldn't Thank be you. on yeah. on, a, on a stage telling others to do it because it's going to work a part of a muscle and isolate an area of a muscle to build and develop. It's to the point now where I go work out at commercial gyms. People don't ask me questions because they're sick of the long winded answers I get. <laughs> there's a there's one. I Why do. are you gripping the bar that way? Exa and that is. Let me get a dry erase oh board and explain. God. Yeah, no, yeah. seriously. Like all in my in my office like that is method. in Boss Barbell. Yeah. I've taken the out onto the floor and literally like drawn a picture for people to understand. That's great. What gets me is the uh, the tricep grip one, that debate. Oh, oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, supinated. I, dude, I could go for like, I mean, that's one I have just like, I should just have it printed and laminated and be like, here, read this. Read this while I do my next <laughs> set. If you have any questions, let me know. Because yeah. it's just like, if you don't have an intent in everything you do, then don't do don't it. Do it. I, think, fucking time. I think the biggest thing is, uh, is people uh, think of the muscles and forget about the CNS. They forget about the recruitment patterns. They forget mm. about... Uh, how that is really probably more important than the actual dumb muscle itself when you're talking about working, you know, strength and all these different things. I think, I mean, that's that's such a huge part of it. Like the the the, no, the hashtag no days off crew. Like, okay, see you later. Like, you're not going to make it. But I think a real understanding of muscular anatomy and action, like the idea of secondary, tertiary, quaternary action of muscle blows people away. Mm -hmm. Like the, the long head of the biceps tendon blending to make, you know, your, your glenoid labrum. If you don't know that, then you're going to do your bicep curls at your side the entire time, not mm -hmm. use it as a secondary flexor, not worry about that active insufficiency when you're trying to train the bicep as a secondary flexor of the shoulder and not a primary flexor of the elbow. And it's like, if you really want to dig into it, I mean, you can go, you could spend like days on every muscle group and like, you know, thinking of like force curves and, and dynamic stabilizers, like how... All you got to do is look at an anatomy chart mm. and all the muscles touch each other. They're yeah. all overlapping yeah. Yeah. and connecting. And influencing, and, yeah. I mean, and the fascia and covering the whole thing. Yes. That, I, mean, yeah. I mean, that you want to you wanna complicate things. People have a hard enough time with base, what I consider basic anatomy. Mm -hmm. Talk to him about fascial planes. Yeah. Right. Holy oh shit. God. You're like blowing people's minds. Yeah, right. It's the human body is far, far, far more complex than we think. Yeah. And, you know, bodybuilding has done some great things and it's easily the most influential, uh, you know, I guess, route of fitness that has influenced us in terms of resistance training. The average person who lifts weights got most of their information from the bodybuilding world. But one of the things that they did that was absolutely horrible that now we're starting to see that, you know, a lot of the repercussions of is 
that they break everything down to these very just to, to, to muscles, yeah. to individual muscles, yeah. bicep, tricep, delt. This is the side head. This is the front, you know, the anterior head. This is the rear delt. And it, when you train that way, um, you you can cause lots of problems. We yeah. see it all the time. So let's let's talk about some. Let, let's really dumb it down for people and give some simple takeaways. What are some like go to moves that you? either like always incorporate in your own training or you typically teach somebody like you know you already know either by the way they look or all the imbalances that you're used to seeing that are very common like incorporate this this and this into your lifestyle and this already will start to help you lunging lunging is i mean to me i'll i'll assess someone's lunge before i assess assess their squat yeah every day of the week now explain that why is that so important um so we live like it's it's nine to five that's part of it yeah Mm -hmm. but i think I, I look at, I mean, functional training mm-hmm. is the buzzword of the past. I sense the BOSU ball came out yeah, or maybe yeah, yeah. before that, right? Like that is the selling point to the mm-hmm. uninitiated. I mean, I cringe every time I hear <laughs> it, but, oh, no. but let's talk about, you know, biped humans. Yes. Let's talk about function. Let's walk first, right? So a, a gait analysis can be really difficult and it mm-hmm. takes an acute eye and a pretty, you know, good working knowledge of the underlying anatomy to really assess why your foot's pronating or, you know, why your heel striking early on one side. But if you take that, that very sort of um, benign assessment, that seemingly benign assessment, you stretch it out. That's what a lunge is. You're taking the gait through its end ranges of motion. Mm-hmm. Then things become very apparent. Like I always use this analogy, like if I was to try and, I don't know, shoot Adam in the head. Right. I wouldn't have to be I could be five degrees off and still blow his fucking brains out. Right. He's but, sitting right next to me. Yeah. But if I'm <laughs> but if I'm going to try and shoot the guy morbid, across dude. the street, yeah. well, this is, the, this is what it takes to get through to people. If I'm trying to shoot the, shoot the guy across the street and I'm a couple degrees off, I'm going to clean over his head. He didn't won't even know he's in danger. It's yeah. the same thing with hip mechanics and body mechanics. If you look at that longer range trajectory. So it's like if I'm trying to assess the hip, I'll start with the foot and make it. I mean, I can look at the hip and see it's like, OK, he's internally rotating here. I don't need to look for that toe pointing in. Mm -hmm. I know by looking at it because I've done it enough times. But to make it apparent to them to increase the likelihood of Mm buy-in, to get them to correct it, the lunge is huge because it's like, you know, they do a conventional lunge, 90-90, no knees over the toes. It's like, okay, lose all that, all that, what Mm -hmm. your trainer told you before shit. Try and anchor the heel, drive that knee as far over as you can, an athletic lunge. And then this is what I always get is I want to see both hips externally rotate. This was something that you opened even my eyes, and I've improved my lunging after you and I did that series together. And uh, I never realized I had a discrepancy in my hips until I had to get that glute med to fire and open up on one side, and it was actually, I had to really, one side very natural for me, other side very unnatural for me. And you'll notice, too, a discrepancy in stride length. So I usually mm-hmm. mark that because it's 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 hardwired that stability, right? They feel tight to get into it because that's a really un, you're basically in like almost a front split position as far as your femurs mm-hmm. are concerned. Now you made a point earlier about uh, hip flexor, mm. right, as a single designation, and it's like whoa, whoa. I mean, and you have yeah. to oversimplify. It. And a lot of times it's self diagnosed, right? Like Silicon Valley itis people, they <laughs> they web MD themselves, and it's like oh, it's probably <laughs> tight hip flexor. All right, which one? Iliacus, psoas, rectus femoris, TFL, your adductor brevis and pectineus both act like hip flexors. You tell me which hip flexor it is, right? Sartorius acts as a flexor adductor external rotators. Like, which one? And in usually, and in what position? Exactly, yeah. because all these are acting on a on a movement or on a joint that has freedom of movement in all planes of the body. So linear extension, and this is why I cue the lunge the way I do, is only going to affect a certain group of muscles. Usually, linear extension is more uh, stretching of the iliacus. Then you get a lum- lateral lumbar shift, and that'll get more onto the onto the psoas. But if you externally rotate and abduct that back hip, because usually we're very f- front focus when that front leg lands and I cue them to go knee over the toe they think that's it mm-hmm. they can keep the heel down like okay chest is up good. Yeah, you're, you're watching the back too the back leg because that's the one I'm most worried about I mean nine to five when you're sitting in this hip flex position it's like all your hip makes perfect sense because your leg behind you uh probably has very little strength and stability if you're an average person yeah, sitting down and that's the point you know taking it and building strength at those end ranges of motion and creating or narrowing a threshold is how I describe it. Mm -hmm. You know, strength and stability. Because what gets me is when people get hurt, it's like, I don't understand. I've been doing the same thing every day. And today I went to time. Exactly. You've been headed for that threshold your whole fucking life. And you went and picked up your kid's toy. And then that was, that was Mm -hmm. it. So uh, my buddy, Jordan uh, Junta, he, he's, he says it really eloquently. And pain is the first symptom to appear or the last symptom to appear, the first one to go away. 
Hmm. So it's like your sub threshold forever, n- not realizing it because you can't sort of internalize. Wow, it. that's a good point. So in other words, uh, you know, feel, you you can feel pain, you can make it go away, but you haven't corrected the problem. Just because yeah. you don't hurt anymore, doesn't mean you're not at that sub threshold anymore. Yeah. Like there's a lot more work that needs to be done to oh, get absolutely. you away from, that, from yeah. that level, which is before the pain actually happens. Because what I mean, you get in my office all the time. You send them away with correctives, they feel good, and then they're back in there like three months later. Okay, when's the last time you did your correctives? Well, when I started feeling better, I stopped doing it. It's like, well, well shit, man, should I have V eight? Like, come on, man, <laughs> right? So, I mean, to me, it's like it's just it's just so apparent that it's so the lunge. Sorry, get back yeah, to the yeah, point. The yeah. lunge would be my big one for the lower body because mm. um, you walk through that cycle that you have that and enhance. how you do the lunge. So, I, I'll sure. d- make sure that we put a link on this episode for that series that we did together because I'll tell you that this has become a staple uh, warm-up to me getting ready for like training my mm-hmm. legs is I'll do all my prime movements that get me going, like my 90-90 swings, all that bullshit, right? So I get all, I get, and then I'll go into the lunge and I get barefoot. I get barefoot and I do the walking lunges on the grass in here and I'm really focusing on that, letting my, and I never did that before where I concentrate on my back leg and try and open my hips up at the same time as I'm lunging forward. And man, I just feel amazing getting yeah, ready to get that's, my- I mean, For me, that's a staple for lower body. Upper body, um, I do, I think we did it in here, the overhead press against the resistance band. Mm. I think rotator cuff training is, a lot of people miss the mark because it's the idea of training something that is supposed to be active sort of behind the scenes. Like when you- So yeah, because people typically do a lot of like just, yeah, isolation, external rotation of the humerus here with my elbow yeah. on my side, which is one small piece and that. if you're loading it appropriately, more often than not, I see that loaded with dumbbells. It's like, guys, the first gym guru that ever existed <laughs> was Isaac Newton. Gravity's not going anywhere. You, that's isometric flexion. That's training your brachialis, yeah. maybe. Oh, you mean Newton. when people are standing straight up? Yeah, just oh, that's using, using, using plates. Yeah, and it's like, well, hey, that's rear moving. delts. Yeah. And like you're, you know, you're shortening the rear delts and you're isometrically contracting your brachialis. Yeah. Adorable. Your rotator cuff's doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. So like matching the plane of movement that you're going to have to We should, okay, no, wait, 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 stop. We need to explain what you just said explain really quick visually because I see this in the gym all the yeah. time. All and, the time. And I'm sure people look at me all weird when I have to get on the bench, so I'll lay down sideways to actually yeah. do it. But so when you're you see this a lot, guys before they bench and they've heard this like, oh I should warm my rotator cuff up. Yeah. And then they grab dumbbells and they do these f- flapping their arms, yeah. Yeah. not realizing that like they're getting like no rotator cuff. Well there's cuff. no it's, resistance. It's like exactly. seal flappers. Yeah. Well yeah. as ambiguous a designation as hip flexor is rotator cuff is equally there. Right? Like it's on the same parallel. It's the upper body equivalent to hip flexor um, mm-hmm. is to the lower body what rotator cuff is to the upper body and shoulder because it's like name one of the muscles. Yeah, That's right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Amphitrinatus, teres minor, supraspinatus, yeah. uh, subscapularis. Right? What, what does each one do? Where exactly. Does it do? And yeah. that's And depending matters. again on the position, position of the humerus, exactly. position of the mm-hmm. scapula, what kind of movement you're doing. I mean. So one, I really, I, you know what, I'll change my mind because we we have this on, on we have the overhead press with the band uh, on the YouTube channel. Dead hang, chin up position just initiating the pull-up yeah. mm-hmm. that's that's probably my go-to for the so upper like body. a downward shrug yeah essentially but no, I, or like I, circles I, independently with your scapula like going like oh yeah. okay dead hang overhead bring my shoulder blades together drop the chin to the chest and let passive elevation uh-huh. right explaining people the two axes that the shoulder blades work on the elevation uh elevation depression protraction retraction i want to be fully elevated yep. and protracted but two you know we talked about training muscles and not or yeah. instead of training movements yeah. this is a perfect example of training movements right when you set your scaps the the shoulder motion i mean if you think about it it starts from the thoracic spine flex thoracic spine sort of increases that like if you're hunched forward all day sets mm-hmm. that rib cage on a trajectory back that's going to glide those shoulder blades up and out mm-hmm. right just because the way the the, the it's going to round them yeah the force vectors of the muscles that attach to it are just going to naturally set them in that and now from there if we think about shoulder movement two thirds of the movement is going to come from that ball and socket the last is going to come from that actual socket being able to accommodate for any end ranges of motion that's, that's why. why if you try to reach overhead and lock your scapula in place you ain't going anywhere exactly yeah. but, and we talked about the stability thing right like if I'm loading something in my hand overhead that's when people like feel like their wrists are weak 
So with what I like with the dead hang scap sets is like let it let it hang because you're you're not in a heightened state of awareness. You're not threatened. It's a distraction force. You're not spinal loading. So people can, regardless of shoulder mobility, can usually get to that almost like Olympic mm-hmm. lifting overhead position when they like, wouldn't be able mm-hmm. to normally do it exactly. Yeah. And from there, the first thing I'll cue is the elbow position because that. So in this position, why people get pain by my estimation and what I see in my office the most and what fixes it is the tear. Terry's minor is the, what initiates this movement, right? Mm-hmm. So the bodybuilding culture that has a lot of like impingement issues, anterior uh, anterior tilting of the scap, internal rotation, because they train everything in isolation. So they you, would, see, you see the elbows cave then? Is that what you see or what happens? Um, no, I see them go yeah. internally rotate first, get into their lats and keep it in the lats the whole time. Ah. Yeah, like, they, stay, they, they stay in this tight kind of lat. They, they yeah, can't even relax in that position. Yeah. yeah, so they never return to the dead hang. Have but, you ever looked at like a gymnast hang from rings? Yeah. And you see their scapula just rotate mm. out real nicely and incredible. So if we think of those muscles that are going to work along that line towards the spine, right? That lower trap that's going to depress yeah. that shoulder blade, bring that inferior angle towards midline and sort of initiate that movement. But that's from the spine to the shoulder blade. From the actual humerus to the scapula, what happens is to get into a position to use your lats to act like internal rotators, you need to externally rotate your shoulders first. So if I'm in this dead hang, this is internal rotation, mm-hmm. right? What I do first is here. Yeah. Right. And that's extra. That's your terrace minor. Yeah. And that's and your lats. Of your two, of the two muscles. Well, that gets you in a position where you can use your lats. Yeah. So of the two muscles of the external rotator, the infraspinatus is your bigger one. That's your arm flapping on the side mm. when you're, if you're mm-hmm. doing it right anyways. But the teres minor is smaller, much smaller, but it is most active or most needed in that end range position. So initiating there under like no like no direct stress. Like people usually, uh, a cardinal sign of anterior impingement is that they point to the sort of the coracoid process, that coracocranial arch front of the shoulder. Here, pinches right here. Yeah, so yeah that's where that teres minor needs to externally rotate and pull that humerus ah. out instead of instead of it's not it's internally rotating that mm. that subscout or the supraspinatus tendon or the bicep tendon is going right under that arch and you're just mechanically pinching it. So from here, if you can externally rotate under load. That to me is for my upper body. That's my go-to. Mm. Oh, like, we'll definitely, we'll definitely so, shoot that. So video. you want to hang yeah. from the bar. We're yeah. gonna shoot this. Chin tuck we'll, down, we'll, sh- we'll shoot this. And then you want to rotate. Yeah. And you want to kind of twi- almost like you're twisting your elbows in a little exactly, bit. Exactly. Because that's, that's external it. rotation. Yeah. On yeah. the longest lever possible. Right. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. You, totally yeah. you know, it's funny. Uh, I remember years ago doing uh, behind the neck pull downs and understanding where to kind of put my elbows mm. and my positioning. It was one of the best things I ever did for my yeah. shoulder mobility way mm. back in the day. I remember, like, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because, yeah. you know, so-and-so does it. And I remember positioning my elbows, not feeling it in my lats that much, again, because I'm not able to right. pull them in front of me, yeah. but noticing that my shoulder mobility got a lot better from doing yeah. it. Because you're training the stabilizers that sort of shut down the CNS and say, hey, no, everything's fine. You, you mm-hmm. may pass. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, load, distal this all you want. We're rock solid. That's fine. Very cool, dude. Yeah, no, very, I like that cool. a lot. We, that, I, we went from like packing the shoulder, right, to, to create that stability, yeah. like, uh, and really force that issue versus now, like, setting the shoulder. So yeah. there's a little bit more of a. So that would be the progression of the reach. bottom now under kettlebell press. Rotation. Yeah. Same thing. That's the first thing I cue. It's like literally, it's the just a different vector where now we're, like you said, we're pat, now we're going to pack the shoulder, but now can you stabilize? from here, Mm -hmm. tuck the elbow in. Because now, I mean, this is inherently stable if my wrist is over my elbow, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All I need to do is lower that down. Granted, I need to have the right scapular positioning to allow for that full flexion to happen. But the first thing I cue, so the progression from this movement is right in to a single arm kettlebell press. Now Mm. we're packing the shoulder. Now we're going to see how that grip responds to that sort of Mm. rewiring from that dead hang scap set on the overhead position. Dude, wow. I'm going to be doing that. I yeah, know. We, awesome. we definitely should go shoot a video. In fact, we should do that right now. Dude. Yeah. yeah. We'll do that. We'll do that. In, a sec. In, the, in the powerlifting world, with the way you train, do you see anybody uh, uh, approaching training kind of like you do? Or is it, it more just training? Well, you those, mentioned those movements. Uh, Romwad in like yeah. what they're up to. Like they're CrossFit. Like, okay. Yeah, they're they're more in the CrossFit realm. I mean, they 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 cross over and they they break in a little bit. But yeah, as far as our like my style of training, it's I mean it's catching on. It has to mm-hmm. like yeah. if you want to be in this because if you look at the guys at the if you're top, smart. You <laughs> yeah, because I mean it's it's that stuff doesn't get posted. But I mean guys are doing this. 
And it's the guys that the, their videos are consistently, you know, 500 plus benches. They're consistently 800 pound squats, 800 pound mm-hmm. deadlifts. Mm-hmm. They're doing it. It's not on Instagram because no one likes it. So all they, all it's the kids, boring. It, it's boring. Yeah. And it's like, they're, it's, and those who are sort of flash in the pan coming up, mm-hmm. got there just by you know, some genetic freak bulletproof resiliency to, you know, bad form and no stability work are starting to see the writing on the wall because they've seen other people who've come up real quick go down just as quick as they've come up. So, you know, building that foundation, building that stability. But, I mean, all that's for naught if you can't assess it. That's right. Right? And the predictive value, and that's really difficult because that takes more than a smile. And I think what people, there's a big misconception with injury in that, you know, oh, well, you're a strength athlete. You're training with heavy weight. The reason why you hurt is where, they think of it like a car. Like, oh, it's wear and tear. It's because of age or um, you know, and the reality is, is no, um, you're just not, again, you're not training those, those areas that will move that threshold forward. And so you're just kind of bumping up against it. And yeah. at some point you're going to end, it's going to give, and you're going to have some problems. And we see tons of athletes uh, who've done this. I've experienced it myself with my own training and what a lot of people don't really like, it's not sexy, but here's the sexy part. If you do pay attention to this kind of stuff. You will build more muscle, burn more body fat, and perform better. So at the end of the day, the results are what you're looking for also, besides the fact that you're going to avoid injury and stuff. Because I know we have a lot of young listeners who are like, I don't hurt. I don't care. I feel fine when I squat, when I deadlift, when I, you know. I mean, that's, and that's the buy-in I go for. Like, because, I mean, I could, you know, you put up the flashy list every now and then. But the majority of my social media content, like doubling back to the whole fitness industry thing, is there's a lot of people that get to where they are by – by notoriety, not by credibility, mm. right? So the difference being like, you know, do as I do and like, oh, the, and their de facto response to like any sort of further questioning is like, but I squat 800 pounds. So it's like, for me, it's like, mm-hmm. I've yet to have to drop it. I was just speaking in Toronto and I literally, my seminar was why CrossFitters suck at swatting. Like that was, <laughs> and, I, and I did, and I presented this to a room full of oh. CrossFit box owners. Oh, they love yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and I, from my, and I wouldn't do it if I didn't think I was fairly or mostly unimpeachable, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's like, I'm standing in a room with guys that maybe squat 405 and I can put seven. 3727. So it's like, if need be, I have this smoking gun. <laughs> if some you got the if, ace up the sleeve. Exactly. Yeah. If some brainchild in this group like has read more shit than I have or read more research or <laughs> looked into the anatomy uh, more than I have. Yeah. I, I I can play that card if need be, which yeah. is like a lot of guys that come up who are getting into because I mean seminars now are great money. But you you know, I've said this before, you can you can put furniture in a room, but you have to have steel in the fucking walls, right? And the seminars are basically like, hey, come out, w- come work out with me. I-, I can't really say anything, but I'll show you how I deadlift. And it's like, there's no assessment. There's no, there's no predictive value oh of where, you know, or no consideration of morphology. Like, oh God, fuck. You know what? Let's talk about it. Like, have you ever seen the Lane Norton diagram of how he squats and that breakdown, that sagittal plane breakdown? Have you ever seen it? I oh man, it's priceless. This. It's absolutely priceless, but so it's like you mentioned him earlier. I feel like you, uh, you know. I don't, well, I know. I already, no, we spoke on nutrition earlier. I already and know. I was, I, I was vague, right? Like yeah, I don't like yeah, kombucha, it's hippie, yeah, crunchy yeah, granola, yeah, not yeah. for me. Give me things that had parents. That's my sure. take on nutrition, <laughs> right? But like, because I, I, I mean, I, I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I have eight years of school. I have thousands of hours under. You know, I have, I have a clinical doctorate, not a research doctorate. Yeah. So the uh, assessment is everything. When you're mm. in my office, that's what it is. Fuck yeah. I've, you know what? I, I, man, I, I don't know how many patient files I have, but the, with acute injuries that come in, I don't know if I have two, maybe three visits on average. So I have all these files. People are like, oh, you must be so busy. It's like, no, because I don't see people every week. Because, I mean, my office visit is purely an assessment. Movement, it really is the fix. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I'll spend half my office and we bring it out to the gym floor. This is what you got. This is how you stabilize it. This is how you stretch mm-hmm. it. This mm-hmm. is how you control it. This is how you avoid it from happening. This is how you program mm-hmm. around it. Go. Let me know if you have problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Hit me up on email. Send them a few videos. That's the progression. Good. See you. So, see with, you. so with Lane's squat, because uh, he so had a hip a, injury recently. He's always he's, injured. He Well, because yeah. that's it. And you know what? Dude, I wouldn't even want to sit in this room with the, that guy if he was talking nutrition. Mm. PhD in nutrition. That's, dude, that's your that's your wheelhouse. Mm. I don't I don't speak on it because that's not what I studied. Sure. I mean, by my designation, he has a PhD in herniating discs in your low back. Mm. It's because when you watch his squat, it's like the femur length thing. And it's like, okay, dude, you're not rotating your hips and your fucking chest is on your knees. If you use your glutes to stabilize the 
that SI joint stabilized low back, you wouldn't run into these issues. But you know, you can lead a horse to water. But to me, it's like and Jim Stepani. I mean, mm-hmm. if we, yeah, if we want to get on a you know get behind a common enemy here, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. PHE yeah. and nutrition. I wouldn't dare. Dare sit down in a room with this guy and try Except to talk he tells people eat fucking, you know, five million grams of protein every day. Well, yeah, he, because he it's, protein powder. it's pre-gym, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the whip. pre but, Yeah, Yeah, um, but it's, it's the same thing. And it's well, like, to, to Lane's, uh, to Lane's um, credit, he, he when we talked to him off air, I mean, he said that when it came to exercise. Like, that's not my, yeah. like, I understand how to, whatever, but that's not my expertise. Yeah, but the problem with it, though, is, is, again, like what I was saying, is the thing that people tend to do is, they they should if if that's not your expertise then stay away from yeah. it. Yeah. then stay away from well it's teaching the whole mentality it and, it's, the, it's the beast mode like go 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 mentality which, which is so interesting to me yes, yes. because yes. coming from that like it's 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 laughable I mean mm-hmm. I train in a gym like I train in like what I consider to be like the strongest gym in the states mm-hmm. I mean we got four world record holders across numerous weight classes and it's like to see him rant and roar over like a six hundred pound squat it's like we got guys half his size going, yo, you done yet? Like, can I, can I get in on this first warm ups, that sort of thing? So, but I mean, to understand the responsibility of a following you have like that, and then to put out something like that, that sagittal plane description of the squat, it's like, you're, you're showing a two dimensional uh, depiction of a three dimensional, right. Movement, of a movement right? so much more complex. Where, I mean, I'll, if I were to assess the squat, like to assess someone's squat, I'll front to back or yeah, front to back first. I want to see how, when you go into deeper knee flexion, how you're accommodating for stability of that knee by externally rotating the hips of that bottom position. I don't want to see some linear forward, forward fold through three joints, ankles, knees, and hips. I don't mm-hmm. want to see that. I want to see those hips loaded. I want to see you load into the quads first. Then as you go into deeper knee flexion, I want to see you externally rotate. I want to see those knees and toes stacked at the bottom. Yeah, your knees can go over. That's fine. Sit back at the very end. Drive those hips through. Use your quads to pull your hips to that advantageous position to finish the fucking rep. Perfect. Mm. I want to see that from the front. From the side, tells me next. Tells me depth. But if you're squat, if you're a good squatter, you can see depth from the front, anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's my little rant on. on <laughs> just, I mean, just don't don't talk on things you don't know because I think you know, like you said earlier, a lot of the audience, a lot of people that are into this are young young kids that want. They're impressionable and like, I mean, shit. The stuff I did like before I met my boy was ridiculous. Like you read some stuff and there's, there's no assessment. Just do this. Like and whether it's right for you or not, just do it. Mm-hmm. And it's like that. To go out and go out of your way and out of your lane, pun not intended, it, to me it's irresponsible. Yeah, right. the the uh, when it comes to to movement and exercise uh, and even nutrition, uh, there are general truths, but the individual variance is so massive mm. that uh, it's incredible. You could have two people with the same goals, and what one exercise and one movement may be perfect for one person and for the other person. Not only is it not perfect, but it's the worst thing they could it's possibly do. It's splitting the atom. Mm-hmm. You split it one way, you light up the world. You split it the other way, you blow the world up. And now it's the – it's the and, in, and I'm biased, obviously, because I have a, a clinical designation. It's the ability to assess. Like we talk about dogma and research and that religious tenets therein. If someone is a PhD and there's a lot of guys who do – I mean, fuck, I'm not new to this social media. Put the doctor in your title and then hopefully people listen to you and hope you know what you're talking about. But it's like there's – you need to understand that there's no assessment of when and where to apply this research. This is for those six people, college age males that participated in this mm, four week study. Great point. That works for them, clearly. Well, this is what I I feel like we get in debates about all the time. Like, I mean, I don't have a PhD. I, and yeah. when people try and use that as your argument is as silly to me, which I don't use, but it's like, bro, I've trained thousands of mm. people that I can go back and look at. Like, Good. You read a study that took thirty people together yeah. that was controlled, that was probably biased. But even if it sure. wasn't biased, it was and then you extrapolate some of that, take that bit of information, and then now you become an expert on it. Fuck you. But you're a great <laughs> example. So when I first started writing for Craiger, the first thing I wrote, and I fucking love it to this day. I still talk about it. It's called "What We Can Really Learn from Research." It was the first online article. I was nervous as hell. I like messaged over like, "Hey, can you share this?" Like, oh fuck, and. It was, and you're a great example because what you're doing now, right? Like I listened to you guys and you guys swung wellness, you swung health for mm-hmm. a bit. And then you're like, you know what? Let's get diesel. Let's put on some calories. Let's lift some weights kind of thing. I was like, oh, fucking right, man. Absolutely. Because mm-hmm. I was going to give you some shit for some of the barefoot fucking in the Come on, bro. But, <laughs> Come on, bro. But and like, I my just point got into my, crystals. My, my <laughs> point to that is like, 
you have variables controlled. And what is research but controlling variables and, and, and uh, analyzing and sort of this PICO evaluation of like you analyze, you assess, you, you implement, and then you reassess, right? Mm-hmm. So if I gave you an equation with too many variables, then implanting a constant doesn't mean anything. You have all your variables dialed in. Dialed in. Now it's like, okay, I'm going to change this variable, this diet variable. I'm going to change that. It's, it was a constant, so I know what that constant can do for me. Now I change it. Mm-hmm. And then I see where it goes. And like, obviously, you've done this with yourself, you know, mm-hmm. thousands of times, and not even just yourself, with other people. Like being able to sort of put all the pieces together. Because if you have too much to equate for, there's nothing you can do. So the real, the, the real thing from research that we should learn from is to turn every, every endeavor that you go into, mm-hmm. like, I'm going to try gluten-free, I'm going to try whatever it is, I'm going to try 5 through one I'm going to go five by five. It's like, if you don't have a, a control to start with, you don't know. Or if you throw the kitchen sink at everything, like, I'm going to overhaul my life, and then you start eating right, and you start walking. It's like- And how do you know what's really helping yeah, you? Yeah, like, oh, the Herbalife supplements were, were the one. Like, that did it. It's like, dude, you changed 20 variables. How can you isolate that in itself and say that that was the effective one? It's but, so- it's so complex in even how the variables interact with each other exactly. and how mm-hmm. they're applied. And mm-hmm. I mean, well, and then let's so, throw that, let's throw the psychological curveball in there too, because there's a huge mental game in all of oh this. Oh my God. Too. Like, like Dude, psychology your... trumps physiology every day of the week. In Boom. My opinion. And that's wow. why, that's Wait, why hold I... on a second. That's v- absolutely a hundred percent agree with you. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. That is very, very true. And as personal trainers, what, like as a, I've been doing this for 20 years, uh, I learned that early on, and that's what made me successful. Yeah. Was that the psycholo- psychology was the most important factor in all of this, yeah. in all of the person trying to get you know lose weight and get fit and all that stuff, and take that all the way out to top end performers, right? Take it all. I mean, take that away from the the personal training client that's trying to get fit. Mm-hmm. You know, put that in what. So in Australia, power, go back to powerlifting, just double back really quick. There's two hours and 24-hour weigh-ins. Those are the common ones, right? 24-hour weigh-ins, you get a whole day, eat whatever the hell you want. I come in at a heavy 242, like 110 kilos. Like I'm, I'm spitting into a fucking cup before I step on the scale. Mm-hmm. So in Australia, I compete on two-hour weigh-ins. So I've, I saw a two-hour window. It's like, hey, weight moves weight. Go for it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I did everything under the sun. I probably put on like 13 pounds, just like hydrating. Getting, dude, I felt like shit. You know, I would sip on espresso, caffeine, and bring down the blow a little bit. But, dude, I was walking into like, I was walking into third attempt deadlifts, and I was like, you know, I. But I know in my mind, like everything's done. All the training is done. Mm-hmm. Every everything's in place. Fucking get up there. There's five thousand people. Grip and rip. Just fucking do it. And it's like physiologically, like if you looked at my diet that day, like this guy should not be working out. He should be on <laughs> dialysis in a few years, but he should not be working out. But if the the headspace from whether it be the soccer mom or whether it be the top end athlete, the psychology, if you can get, yeah. you get it right between the ears, man, you got it. Have well, you identified, have you seen this happen? Because you've been doing this now for a while and you've been working with uh, athletes and people with pain and uh, movement issues. Have you been, a, have you made connections between their emotional state and how they feel in terms of pain? Oh yeah, somatization, like, and getting away from maybe elite athletes, but like, you take a post-op spinal fusion. That's just a fucking nightmare. Founded in no research whatsoever. It, there's, there's a. I mean, chronic pain is in itself. Uh, it's a cause and a symptom, right? Mm. So a lot of the musculoskeletal stuff I treat, you know, happy go lucky, you know, weekend warrior powerlifters. That's there's no, they're not. There's not a relationship with their pain. But when you're on disability and you can't work, you can't provide, and it's an insurance company that's providing for your family, not you, there's, there's a dependency on that pain. Like chronic pain is a whole another bag of cats. But the best thing I found is being able to regress exercise down to the point where there's that, that psychological component, that triumphant component. I mean, it's something as simple as like a step up to like a six inch box it can be painful for someone. But if you can regress it to a point where they can get there, there's hope we've overcome. Ah, such right. And next thing you know, next, yeah. small wins, man, exactly. small wins. And I mean, yeah, chronic pain, pain is a whole nother bag of cats in itself. But like to me, regardless, psychological or movement based, the fix for me mm-hmm. is movement. First. Cause you can get to the brain through the body just as the brain gets to the body or the, the brain gets to the body through like the nervous system, you can retroactively have that effect, right? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, my treatments in my office are, you know, there's there's the there's the muscle work, there's all that, but it's really hinged on assessment. And it's like, how can, because I look at it this way, like if you go into an office and someone, the chiropractor, PT, whatever, massage therapist, they're, 
the external stimulus that they're putting in deep pressure massage is a, is a thumb through the safety pin of the nervous system, mm-hmm. right? There's that, there's that sensory input that says there's some sort of instability or I mean, there's sometimes a metabolic component, but it goes back to the brain. The brain says, lock it down. That's tightness. That's trigger points. That's whatever you want to call it. Now, I can have an external effect through different routes of the nervous system. You know, uh, think of muscle relaxation like a, like a lock. And we have a ton of different keys that can turn that lock to make that muscle relax. Heat. Uh, biochemical, take a ibuprofen, take a, take a Vike. Let me know how you feel. You're sure you'll be flying, right? Um, deep pressure stimulus has an effect on nerve endings specific for muscle relaxation. Stretching, the Golgi tendon organ, muscle spindles. And when taken to that end range of motion, it has a feedback to the brain that says, hey, relax. this is, yeah, exactly, relax. This is going to go bad quick. Hell, you know, touch. Yeah. Touch by itself sure. will do this. There's yeah. people who will go get massage. And I didn't, this used to blow me away. They'd be like, I have tight shoulders. But I want super light massage. I remember yeah. thinking like you're wasting your time. Yeah. But they'd come out and feel better and it's touch. And to your for... spinal thalamic tract, man. That's where light touch is perceived. That's, there's, and that is the input to that that breaks that safety pin cycle, right? That constant feedback loop. But what you do with that transient time of that broken that's the fix. Mm-hmm. So that's where I mean everything starts in the office. We'll poke and prod, we'll assess, but fucking load it. So I'm, that- I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just to say that in layman's terms because what you just said was very 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 important. And basically what you're saying is once you send that signal, whether it be through deep tissue massage, heat, or whatever, for that area to relax, now you do the work to fix it so that it doesn't go getting tight and get tight again. Otherwise, all you're going to end up doing is getting stuck in that cycle yeah, of, you time. know, you have an Asian lady walk on your back once a month. Like right. that's going to be, that's going to be it. I mean, that's, and you even preemptively, like if you watch how I warm up, like we'll get a lift in one of these days. And if you watch how I warm up, that's the thought process. So the, the progression and the implementation of different stimulus to open up, to make that transient window, and then to solidify it with some sort of dynamic stability movement, and then lock it the fuck down by putting a lot of fucking weight mm. through it. Load the shit out of that CNS. Like if you watch, my deadlift warm-ups are almost like yoga classes. Mm-hmm. My squat, same thing, bench press, and it's very methodical. It, it's, I break it down into designations of what sort of, what sort of touch or what sort of receptivity, what sort of nerve receptors I'm trying to get to as far as like opening up that window as far as I can. And then I, then I try and stabilize the shit out of it. And then once I have sort of have all the moving pieces in line, then I load it. Then you send a signal. And exactly. It, and so that's your new default. Yes. That we, is solidifying did, a new default. Did we send you uh, our uh, access Prime, you to get Prime? You, get you, you, you literally explained Prime, yeah. Maps Prime. Yeah, exactly. The way when we sat down, the what you're saying, I love. I love talking to brilliant people like yourself, and I do. I do. You're a very, very smart guy, um, and I love hearing you talk about these kinds of things because it makes me feel so good about some of the stuff that we've been preaching and talking about. And I don't have nearly, not even close, the education that you have and knowledge you have. And we were kind of, we were on the right track. I can't wait to send it to yeah, you. And the thing is, like, I haven't seen it. Like, to anyone listening that thinks this is a big setup, like that, I'm pumping up. I have <laughs> yeah. not seen. Yeah, it. that's no, exactly yeah. how. Prime well, this was is what, what uh, you know, our trainer minds the way it works. When we dipped into this, you know internet social media you know podcasting world as a business you know we the first things that we're going through right how can we really help these people well it's tough because even when we created programs we're like fuck you know this isn't for everybody and we know that but we got to you know we have to still monetize and then how do we express that to people that hey these are these are guidelines for you but we encourage modification and that's where the evolution of the youtube channel came was here's things for you to start to learn to assess your own body and tools and then we said none of this is complete until we really teach people how to prep their bodies before they go into even a workout and 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 then think about the trouble think about the the challenges with that like I can't just show a general priming session for squats because I don't know who's priming. You're, what you're describing before you squat and deadlift, you – Specific to you. You did for exactly. yourself. And what's yeah. and it, it, it could be the exact opposite of what sh- someone else would do if their body is different. It's different every day. Yeah. It's different and every time I squat. That's a great squat. one. Yeah. I mean, if I'm, all, if, I'm at, if I'm at my office, I'm at Stanford LA, I'm on my feet, less is more. But knowing that like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm mm-hmm. good. Everything mm-hmm. is where it needs to be. But more than more than that, even warming up has been cons- like people think of it as like avoiding injury. That's the absolute least performance. That a- yeah. yeah, I mean, Dude. if you prime properly, what you're doing is you're like you said, you're setting the body up so that when you send that signal with your workout, it's the signal that you want. Yeah. You're setting up the right default. Um, and I, I mean, 
I've said things like, you know, priming properly will give you 10% more out of your workouts. I mean, I mean that's a number I just... Low-balling it. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Proper priming, you take whatever workout you're doing, you do it right, yeah. and you'll blow your... All of a sudden, your workout that you've been doing for five well, this years was our, kicking ass. This now. was our answer or our pitch on, you know, get rid of the fucking pre-workouts that are full of all kinds of shit that everybody in the world's taking and keep taking more this and more. This is the real pre-workout. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. central nervous system. Yeah, yeah let's do it uh, through these techniques. Yeah, with yeah. That, and save the money, right? You, right? Once you learn how to do it then you don't got to keep paying every single month when you run out in two weeks after you've been scooping four times such a great conversation uh and the direction that we went with this this particular podcast i think you know when we're talking about movement and the feedback between the psychological to the body and, and and from the body to the psychological i think um we're starting to see more therapies uh, utilizing movement, uh, people going in mm-hmm. with depression who have maybe no pain, but they're utilizing movement as part of their treatment and they're getting much better. I think uh, there's science now showing how when people smile, uh, even if they're not happy, they feel happy just because they're just being forcing. in certain positions. I, I mean, it's uh, it's really really cool stuff, and uh, I can't wait to have you on the show again, dude. Yeah, man, I, I didn't I didn't know where this conversation would go, but no idea. But yeah, this is fucking great. I think we could we could I could go with I could keep talking with you for the three. Well, hours, I'm but. I'm pretty certain, considering Jordan's a buddy and that he's in the area, that we'll probably be doing uh, not only more YouTube series, which we'll definitely shoot some for this, but uh, I would love to do some seminars or even hold one of those cool fucking meets here, dude. I think we should get like that a, would be fun. all comers, like yeah, a, like a, yeah, like yeah. no federation. Yeah, no. dude. Hell yeah. yeah. We'll, 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 throw those, we'll throw some ideas around, but I, I, I know for sure that uh, it won't be the last time you guys hear Excellent. Uh, Excellent, man. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate you coming yeah, in, yeah, brother. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks Great. very much. Uh, 30 Days of Coaching is available for free at mindpumpmedia.com. Also, you can find us on Instagram at Mind Pump Media. You can find my page at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maths Anabolic, Maths Performance, and Maths Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.